motion to, well, welcome to the school committee retreat for 2023, this August 23rd. Do I have a motion to open the meeting? Support. Do I have a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are expecting our fifth school committee member who will arrive in about 20 minutes. So I propose that we, I'm going to do some shuffling of the agenda that I'm about to hand out, and I'll let you know what that will be in just a moment. But um, we have some items that Danny's going to start off with business related. That's correct. So on our posted agenda, it does indicate there's one adjustment I'd like to make. So we have posted our discussion of living business uh, services in house and then to the retreat. One other thing that I'd like Chris to speak to, and you can decide if you want to wait until Paul is here or not, um, is some of the change orders on the field. So that would be an adjustment. He met with the designers today. So the adjustment was uh, just adding that. That'll be brief. There's some things we need taken care of or approval or we can move forward. Um, so the first item of business, moving business management services in-house, I would like to propose to the school committee. We currently, Chris is not a Hadley Public Schools employee, although it would most people probably don't realize that. Most of our staff probably don't even realize that. Chris is employed through a third party contractor, Health Management Solution, TMS. And I would like to request that the school committee consider instead of um, two days a week in remote access that we move our business management services in house, um, hire Chris as a full time business manager for Hadley Public Schools. My rationale for this is pretty straightforward. Given the number of capital projects that we have right now, and these will not be quick. We're talking three to five years, probably on some of these projects from our energy updates, the fields, and I am, oh, and hopefully I'd like to talk to the school committee at some point about our play structure out here. These are pretty significant. In addition to our 10 year capital plan that we already have, these three projects are governed by three different procurement laws, 30B, 149, and 28-something is what governs energy. And so Chris is mass, he's certified as a chief procurement officer. He's what's called MCPPO certified. Um, so, and certainly uh, with the volume of work that we have between bids, contracts, change orders, and then we'll be speaking to you about the fields. I would request and strongly recommend that the school committee consider this option. And I would like to do that for this fiscal year. Uh, this would be funded. We already have what we paid for TMS. And um, the additional would be funded through school choice. And we're in a very good position yeah. in school choice in our operating budgets. All right. Well, thank you for presenting that to us. Um, I have to say that. Um, it, it's been night and day difference having TMS in our lives and having the business support services of Chris Deschardins. Uh, I remember a time when we didn't have that. Um, and I can tell you, colleagues, it was not pretty. Um, so um, I fully support um, what you're requesting and I open it up to my colleagues for additional comment questions. Do you want to join us? <laughs> <laughs> I know we're like talking about you right there. I'm like, I'm like did, uh, did we even ask him? I mean, yeah. well, you know, uh, we're happy. Let's yeah. have to say no at this point. <laughs> so, no, I, I don't see, I see that as um, a positive step. Not, yeah, I think. Yeah, the answer is yes, by the way. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't on the school committee prior to Chris's arrival. I joined with his services in place, and um, I had to first when I joined the school committee. Didn't realize he didn't work directly for us, um, and I don't want to take on his roles in any way, shape, or form. You're fantastic. <laughs> you do a great job, and I love being able to think about. Oh, Chris has got that answer. Chris knows that he's taking care of that. So I'm very excited that you want to be our district. Agreed. And I'd just add that with, given the, the capital projects that we have coming down the, the pipeline, I think it's important to have somebody who knows what they're doing in all facets. So, your procurement um, certifications in particular are very valuable to us. The way you manage that process has been so graceful. And um, we're indebted to you for all that you've done so far, and we're excited about all 
that you can do for the these upcoming projects. Thank you. The yeah, procurement can be uh, tricky. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Right. Do you need a vote? I, that would be great. Okay. Do I hear a motion to approve the um, pulling in house the business manager position to be a salaried full time position? I make a motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Thank, Thank you. Yes, good luck. This now. <laughs> yeah. Do you like this move though? I'm asking people if they'd like to do this right. while they're on television. Right. <laughs> See if he started sweating a little bit. <laughs> just the sun. Just... Yeah, right. Very humid out today. Right. The proposal would have gone very bad. Would you like to wait on the change orders until policy or do you have to go to do you need no to no i mean I, I i wasn't sure how long i was going to be here so charlene is reading at the library right now and just gonna okay meet up afterwards is it important for paul to hear this or does he already know or uh, he doesn't know no um what do you want to share some context what are your thoughts um i certainly don't mind waiting i think it might be a good idea you know since he's the one that's kind of closely associated mm -hmm. with the project okay. just to wait until he comes certainly Very good. all right thank you Okay, so moving on with the rest of the school committee retreat, we are, um, I printed out for us uh, an agenda that simply mirrors our strategic plan. We built this document back in 2014, I believe it was at the very first. Yeah, that's when we started. That's, that's correct. correct. Yeah, that I was at the first retreat that I know of in Hadley Board history. And um, this document has been a real sort of uh, um, clarion call, reminding us what's important. And um, I figured there's no better way to scaffold our discussion than to have this at the center and um, have it guide our conversation. So I printed out one for each one of you. It's two-sided. Um, my printer was not um, behaving very well. So there are some like imperfect copies as no. well. Um, it is. Oh, so yes. a stable copy. Oh, great. Um, and pass this down to Alex. Oh, terrific. And uh, the agenda. Well, let's so have one of these around. I'll just keep one. Thank you. You're welcome. So, uh, as you can see here, are the four high level goals. I would like to read for all for goal two uh, because I'm considering that all of our um, green heating, cooling, uh, investment in infrastructure also falls into this area. And um, our most recent conversation was so robust. And uh, Paul brings a lot of good insight to bear. So I suggest that we hold off on that. Um, I also want to hold off on, um, let's see, I think it would be, which our family and learning Falls in yeah, does it help three or four? If I just remind folks of the big, this is aligned to the standards for professional practice. Indeed, it right. is. Right. So, oh, that might be right yeah. there already. Yeah. So, it's instructional leadership. That that's right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, so three is family community yeah. engagement, and D is professional. Right. The way it was written, it doesn't actually. Yeah. yeah. I'm calling it family um, community engagement. So, we'll hold off on three as well towards the end. So, let's start with student learning goal one and also um, goal four. And I think those actually mirror one another really well. It's what do we want uh, for our students and how are we going to support our educators in getting there? So what I thought I would uh, do is just really create a, an open forum for discussion about what things are really working, what things are really not, um, school committee perspectives on, um, on these areas. Yeah. Last time we had a retreat, we had some really incredible ideas that uh, including student language at the elementary school level, including um, a lot of diversity and inclusion initiatives. And so um, without a very specific agenda, I just really want to create space for 
more open discussion. So let's start with student learning goal one. Um, I mean, Sure. Remind us of some yeah. of the, okay. what and you mentioned some of this, right? So the brainstorming. So the big vision when we first talked about this, we connected it to Commissioner Riley's description of deep learning. So learning that is it's rigorous, it's relevant, it focuses on relationships, it asks students to use their minds and their hearts. So students have the opportunity to pursue uh, activities and learning that is meaningful to them that connects with them as a person, where they see themselves reflected in what they're learning. We wanna make sure that that happens and that we have a breadth of opportunities that allow students with very diverse talents, interests, and passions to be successful and to enjoy school. Yeah. This is where some of our conversation at the elementary level, um, yeah. I mean, even keep in mind, the STEAM lab is something that has happened. So now I can say, Humara's been on since the beginning, but some of you at different things I'll mention, you'll say, oh, yeah, I was there for the, the uh, creation of that. So STEAM Lab is something that speaks to that at the elementary school. Um, also, uh, the fact how the elementary has always had this, but has a robust and rich arts program so that all students at the elementary level have opportunities to learn music. They receive art. We, add, we have added STEAM Lab in the last decade. We have added... Yeah exploration of language. So we started very small with Spanish, and then the schedule became much more consistent last year. Schedule is built for this year. And our third grade teacher, Ms. Wang, is eager to begin an after-school opportunity for students who might be interested in learning Mandarin. We'll see how that takes off. Um, would would yeah. you please, um, I apologize for interrupting, but would you please um, exp just explain what Steam is. Because... Oh, thank you. That's good. Thank yeah, you. just in case people are, are no catch watching. me on any on any acronym. So that started as science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Mm -hmm. And so it's really just a place for students to explore. I want to take a moment to thank. It was really helping hearts. There were a lot of people involved with helping hearts, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention specifically Stacy Mashinsky and all of the hard work that she did to kind of galvanize the community around Helping Hearts. We had some road races and other things. And that um, she contributed, in addition to the school committee, allocating operating funds for the STEAM lab. Um, Stacy Mashinsky and others in Helping Hearts really did a great job of fundraising. And so in that space, and when we started, we had, gosh, I think we had a teacher the, about two days a week, maybe three. Yeah, 0. 0.4, 0. 0.6. Um, and now this year it'll be full time. So the students have access to STEAM Lab at least once a week, correct? Mm -hmm. They have assigned time at least once a week. Frequently, students may end up there more often for a whole host of reasons. Teachers can certainly sign up for the lab. Also something new in our STEAM Lab, which connects with that first standard, is we successfully received a Project Lead the Way grant uh, that was pre-COVID. I want to say we got that in the fall of 2020. And as you know, last year we were uh, a PLTW super special school. That is not the name of the designation. <laughs> that's, I think that's official. That's very <laughs> official. Super special. It's really good. Um, which is great because we had just started those programs. Our hope connected with this is to continue Project Lead the Way all the way up to 12th grade. Project Lead the Way courses count toward advanced coursework in terms of um, a school's accountability ranking and what um, folks consider attractive. It's advanced coursework, like AP. So we'd like to move it up. Um, and connected to that, I did apply this summer for what's called a Computer Science Engage grant. Hopefully we get that funded. That would allow um, our computer Ms. Krishnan, uh, Sir Simmons, and other teachers to get together and look at how we are teaching computer science all the way through to Project Lead the Way for exploration from elementary all the way through high school. We really want to make sure that we're doing an excellent job of that. Um, so I have, I have high hopes for that grant. So those are some programs. At, at Hopkins Academy, as you know, we've really put a push. We were one of the first designations for 
early college and innovation pathways for a school our size. Um, so we really were at the, at the cutting edge or leading edge of that. So we have an early college high school designation. We have two innovation pathways designations. We've been approved for planning grants for a computer science um, designation, and we are one of the few districts that was selected for a planning grant and a clean energy designation in innovation pathways. It would be fantastic if we had that, and at the same time we were doing some work in our own school. That would be pretty interesting for our students. So at Hopkins Academy, these aren't the only things, but I know some of the big things that we've been working on have to do career and technical education, innovation pathways, really ensuring that students have all kinds of opportunities to learn about different careers, to kind of test out what their interests are. Last year, we also received a paid internship grant, grant for STEM internships. As a matter of fact, Alex has a new employee. As a result, went through the internship program, and now she's actually <laughs> working for Hadley Media. Okay, as, at, at interim level. At interim level. At interim level, yeah. Um, and uh, so those are some of the places where uh, we put a lot of emphasis in the last decade. And all of those things have taken considerable planning, and we're still working on them. And one thing I want us to be mindful of, yeah. so we're not finished, for example, with innovation pathways. Like I said, we have two more planning grants. So these are things that we don't want to say, okay, checkbox, that's done. And we still are trying to encourage um, more students to participate. But those are some of the big things to understand. Right. Very good. I'm glad you brought up one of those elements, and that's something that also came up the last time and uh, that was around um, providing learning experiences for our students in the technical domains in a way that doesn't require them to have to leave Hopkins and move to an academy or any other vocational school. There's a lot of uh, pride in being here at Hadley, and we have a lot of students who want to obtain those hard skills. Those are areas of our economy that are growing. Manufacturing is coming back. Uh, we have a huge housing crunch across the globe, across the nation in particular, um, that is caused by not having enough skilled electricians, carpenters, plumbers. Um, we all know our own difficulties in securing that talent for our homes and our own personal projects. Um, and that's just because there's a lack of those uh, kinds of trades. Shouldn't be an either or. We ought to be able to provide our students with learning opportunities, just as we've gotten creative in some of the other areas. Um, similarly, I've asked Annie to keep an eye out for how we might be able to do that. And I just want to really make sure to give us some space to talk about why that's important and how we might be able to support that further. Before you folks jump in, you reminded me, we also were successful in securing a grant to do that very work. I know mm -hmm. this is a priority of yours, starting with um, creating a plan, something called the Pioneer Valley Public Safety Academy. Mm -hmm. We'll be doing that's that right. with our police chief, fire chief, and public safety from Hatfield mm -hmm. and from Granby. So formalizing some of the internship opportunities our students have and, and then figuring out how to push them into our respective high schools and share staff. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent example and also one that is not technical. So in terms of trades, like really technical, plumbing, electrical, carpentry, the kinds of things that are that are never going to go away. The explosion of information systems and jobs and high tech jobs, there's always going to be the need to put pipes together to to you know build a house to um, to to wire up the technologies that drive the automation on a power plant floor. Um, so I'm, I'm curious how how we, might we make that happen? I need to say one thing in terms of I, I will say um, our students have always just they've been incredibly um, positive about you know, or had to, I should say they our students have had, had very positive experiences at Smith Oak. They've done incredibly well at Smith Oak. If you were to look at the top academic performers, um, you would notice that a lot of them are from Hadley. So um, I'm not sure. I think that hope that we do something that would complement work with 
because, you know, that is, our kids have a long-standing tradition of excellence there. And uh, some of those shops are not things that we can replicate. Um, may or may not be. It's right. Just it's a really right. good question. Right. Some of them. Whether we could. Yeah. Because we used to have shop. Oh, schools, we did. Yes. Right. Yeah. And and also we have access to spaces where we could bring some of that back. Mm -hmm. We could potentially also do that as collaboration. Some of the parents I've talked to, parents and grandparents of kids, who are facing the very real choice of uh, paying, you know, our district paying, what is it, $12,000 for every student that we send? Mm. $20,000 for every student that we send to Smith Folk. We're sending from our bottom line 20000 for that student to be trained there. And then it's a wonderful program. Definitely has great outcomes. But there are some students who want to remain at home. Yes. And um, so parents from our district have asked, what can we do? to have our students prepare to stay at Hopkins and prepare somewhat for those fields. And frankly, I think some people might think, well, that's those are not college bound kids, so they should go. I would say two things. One, a lot of our college degrees are requiring hands-on engineering and design. And so I think, you know, you're, we're creating a foundation for them to succeed in their collegiate careers. The second thing is when students are uh, like, they might want to go into electrical, there are only so many seats in electrical. Mm -hmm. They can apply to Smith Book and end up not in electrical. They may have to choose between carpentry and plumbing because electrical is fully taken. In my mind, that's not creating opportunities for all our students. And so I'd really like to, to think of how we might be able to make that happen. And I think we could be creative. We don't have to re redo or replicate the intensive infrastructure that exists at a Smith Road. I think we could probably get creative about what kinds of infrastructure already exists in Hadley or what are some of the spaces where we could build and perhaps share with other districts spaces where that kind of training could occur. And, and a few years ago when we talked about this, it just reminds me, because um, I forget, when we kind of brought this up, it was kind of like, rather than an either or, it was kind of like, yeah. right? right? So like you had said, the kids that are like, the parents want them to stay, but the kids are debating whether or not they want to go. It allows them to be able to get their feet wet and get that experience without having to leave the school. So they are able to get their Hopkins Academy experience, still be able to get their curriculum, get the diploma from Hopkins, but be able to at least get their feet wet bare minimum. Absolutely. Um, I know even more like some kind of apprenticeship so that right. they already right. have someone who can take to, them under their wing. Mm -hmm. Similar to some of the programs right. that Amy's already talking about creating. So because, it's not to take away from right. this the That's way right. I'm seeing it. That's right. It's kind of just to satisfy a greater need. Yeah. And, and kids that are really struggling with what, I mean, there's some kids that just want to go to don't Smith, right? And they're, they know mm -hmm. they want it. They know from like ninth grade, that's where they're going. I don't think the intent, at least from my perspective, wouldn't be to stop somebody from going where they want to go, but rather kind of giving those kids who are indecisive on the fence, or on the fence oh, like, but giving them that opportunity to explore it while being able to stay and at what, their school. Right. And a big problem that we face is that if our freshmen decide after freshman year that they would like to go to Smith Folk, they have to go in as a ninth grader. They lose that year. That's all. Um, it it is. I you know I mean I've got kids have done it and they're they're you know they real they know what they what do you know at the age of ninth it it, it right. is it's a big right. pressure for it is, kids it to is. put on at that. I mean I wasn't thinking about that. I mean our kids. I tell you the high school students that I've talked to are unbelievably remarkable. I mean, 10th graders already knowing like where they want to explore careers and colleges. And I'm like, in 10th grade, I was just wondering what I was going to do on Friday night. Like, you know, like they're so, I mean, so many of them are so, but how can we expect But they're all, yeah, but we're, they're also, they say they do. And this is, you know, like I said, I've had now three graduate and um, everything just sounds better. And, 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 and if they think it's going to be something different. Yeah. And then they get there and, you know, my son, you know, my sons have changed majors. Um, but there are also some great 
technical college is with that are four year degrees with you get a business as well as a technical degree. So, you know, I think that in a, and we've had kids that have done amazingly well at so at SUNY Cobble School in New York that is an amazing school that um you it's all hands on. You know, and it works best for students who are hands on. And I think that's where a lot of it is too is these are kids that hands-on learning works for them. So it may not be as easy as just saying, I want to stay at Hopkins, because then there's also the cop that the, the, you know, the kids that are say, I just, I, I don't want the traditional education. I don't want Shakespeare. I don't want, I want, you know, they like the idea of the two weeks on, two weeks off to, you know, so there's a whole different, Right. Way so to look at that. Those students who yeah. really know they want that. Now let's think about the rest of our student body. Mm -hmm. I think our purpose is to create as much exploration as possible. Oh, yeah. To have your students, your kids, be able to try different things and then realize, oh, you know what? I thought it was this, but it's actually, I don't, that requires a lot of social skills. And I don't really want to, I'm not an extrovert. Like you just yeah. learn by doing and trying on different postures of, you know, uh, of skills and traits. And, um, and increasingly, our fields are merging, right? Mm. You don't, you don't, you don't ever major in something and only do that. You're going to be working in teams and working across different disciplines and having to acquire some competencies that are technical in nature. And I think that it will give our students a real edge to be able to say, yeah, I, I know how to do the wiring in my, in my house. I did that. I, I, I did the, you know. I did the, you know, I uh, built that, you know, shed in our backyard or, or what have you, or I built, you know, built the shed on the school property for, for our new fields. Um, those kinds of skills, I think, are incredibly valuable. I know I loved Shaw. Mm -hmm. I, I graduated from a New York high school. It was one of the best. It's some of those hands-on experiences in my middle school and my high school experience were really defining for me. And I consider myself really confident in uh, being able to research how I need to do something and not being afraid to like pick up a hammer and, you know, make something happen. I think a lot of students- No, I think that would, that's- Afraid of Oh things. yeah. And we need to, we need to demystify and really help them acquire those tools. This, this next thing I'm about to say kind of dovetails with that. Yes. I just, no, no, go ahead. I'm, I'll, I'll come in after you go. You go. I think increasingly the way technology is going, what I see in the higher ed space with my uh, day job at Stanford University and traveling to conferences that cater to both higher ed and K-12 spaces is that AI and the use of different artificial intelligence tools are really disrupting uh, different fields that our students will be walking into. Um, they might, we might presently be stuck in computer science is the way to go. We need to, we need to like learn how to code. But students graduating from Stanford with a computer science degree are crying in their, you know, dean's office saying, "I think I majored in the wrong major." computer science degree from Stanford. When you have AI being able to uh, take a prompt from you that says, build me a JavaScript, uh, you know, that does X, Y, and Z things, um, and machine learning and AI can spit that out for you, there's far more, uh, there's far less knowledge required of that student. So we need to really think differently about what we're preparing our students to do in light of that. Um, those hard skills will never go away. Machine learning and AI, they're never going to replace being able to fit to, you know, uh, pipes together um, or being able to wire something. But it's the student that knows how to do those things. And this is gonna segue into a bigger conversation our students need to know how to use AI. I know our initial gut reaction from K-12 all over the world was absolutely not, you must not use it, period. It is a conduit for cheating. And yes, some students 
may use it for that. And there are tools for telling whether or not something has been created using AI. But more and more, the workforce is going to be required to use ChatGPT and other AI tools to do their work faster and better. The, the way we work is going to be different. Think about the revolution of personal computing, the time when there were secretaries that would type up people's letters and their notes and how the personal computer completely changed the way our job is. It's another wave of that nature that AI is going to change the way knowledge workers are going to work. Probably, I would say, all workers are going to work. So I'm going to pause there. And you, you had your hand raised. Hand, hand raised. Yeah. No, I was just going to go back to, I know we talked a little bit about the exploration piece being important, but I also think um, what the value of a high school education is worth um, nowadays is a, an important topic, especially with uh, technical, voc tech uh, being very popular, CTE being very popular. When kids are graduating from high school in those programs, to your point, there's uh, a, a professional work opportunity that's waiting for them. With the rising cost of higher ed, a kid who graduates from high school with a college prep diploma is staring down anywhere from fifty to eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, and that's not going to stop, right? We know that the prices are only going to increase, and so I think a lot of families are thinking like, well, what, or kids too are like thinking like, what's the value of the education, right? So if it's not voc tech, and and I, you know, I think it's hard to, I don't want to say compete. That's not the right word, but I think I'm just going to use it for this this conversation compete with a smith academy because uh, that's not just trying to smith folk not just not just um you know saying like oh we're going to have wood shop or we're going to have these are these are programs that have been in in business for decades right and so it's it's really hard to say like we're going to start a program and rival their their program so that to me is is not necessarily realistic right off the bat but i think you know with ideas with like early college where a kid can graduate with maybe close to associates where they have college experience if if you're offering courses toward the tail end of high school that are focused on computer science engineering ai or in the in some of the trades the plumbing the electrical mm -hmm. i think then you can sell that to a community and, and again, like we we are a community that has uh, in town, but also school choice kids of saying like, when you come here, I don't want to say it's a buffet, but there are options. If you want that college prep education, we have that. We have AP courses. Mm -hmm. We have that opportunity. But if you want early college and maybe earn close to associates where you can go get your degree at a state school for a sheet, or if you want to be able to come out with the experience, it's going to get you just a little bit closer to a VOC or CT or tech program. We, we can, we can kind of, Taylor made that experience for that mm -hmm. because I, I mean, unfor I, not unfortunately, I just think that's kind of where it's going to go. I think we're going to move into a place where it's going to be kind of like dealer's choice. Like, and, and I don't, I agree. I think the exploration idea of figure out what you're going to do when you're 14, 15 is crazy. No way I had any idea what I was doing. I still know. <laughs> um, but I think that's just a realistic part of education now is this idea of like, try some things out early on, see if you like it, pick that pathway. Um, and, and I hope that it and, works out. Right. But I think if we have, I think the, the other part of that is you can say, well, listen, maybe we're not going to have you dive into this pathway. Maybe you're going to follow this semi-traditional academic experience for your freshman and sophomore year and then right. transition into something that kind of goes early college or it goes uh, innovation or it goes more vogue tech, whatever it may be. So and think, there are technical colleges that we could, you know, um, possibly partnership yes. with. I mean, like I said, with my, my, I had three boys three different styles of learning three different outcomes um but you know matt did go to a technical school and now he's actually doing the business side of it greg was actually agricultural business technology so in fact it was a very niche program that he you know he, he does he works with with you know ai um and all of that and john is doing you know his more traditional liberal arts college and it i think that uh there's the kids are afraid of getting like you know they, they feel like they're being you know have to choose so much earlier i mean when i was a freshman in high school like you know uh, you know i, I mean we kind of i mean i went to a college prep school but it wasn't the um the pressure that I think I see kids under today to that, you know, if they don't go the right path and 
maybe they need, you know, to do this or do that. Um, so I think just even giving the kids more guidance in terms of, or more exposure, um, even if it's through, you know, job fairs or, you know, um, the things that we do that helps them realize, you know, nothing is written in stone. There's always a path that we, that you can end up, you know, going where you want to, um, and showing them ways that they can change, you know, I don't want to do another year, but I want, or now I really want to go to vote. All right, well, let's see what we can do to make that work, you know, or get you that. And I think the challenge is we're not the only game in town anymore, right? Like right. kids can go online and take online courses at colleges right now if they want to. Yeah. They can right. they can go to YouTube and learn how to code or do AI, do all of these things. So I think if we're and and again, like I don't I don't want kids making decisions on what they're going to do for the rest of their life when they're fourteen, fifteen. But I right. think exposing them to like here are some of the things you can do because if not, they're going to go outside of our forum and they're going to get mm -hmm. it from somewhere else they already are right and so like i think to your point like not shying away from the ai that the onslaught of technology and saying like all right how can we work with it to make sure that we're continuing to develop you know uh, strong curriculum and strong educational experiences for these kids but also admitting that like we have to kind of tweak the ways that we've always done things because technology is just such a huge part of what we do now indeed he's in there he's in there <laughs> well i'll pull him out okay. there. Do I agree with other Burton says, if I may? Sorry, I'm just going to say that. I'm listening. I'm like, yes, this sounds fantastic. Annie, let's do it. Um, but, and I think it's important too to touch on that point of helping kids out too in any way that we can decrease costs, right? Like the yep. thought of college in general. So the thought of giving them this exposure, <laughs> giving them that experience, that hands on while they're still in high school. So they feel like when they get out of high school, they made the decision on where they want to go to school. Fine. They may change their mind, but at least we've given them that exposure, allowed them a little bit of time to kind of dapple in different areas so that hopefully when they leave high school, they feel, yeah, I feel confident that I'm going the right direction. And also we are able to help them kind of like we've already started and he's already started doing um, with the early college programs, getting them prepped and making it a little easier for them once they start doing whatever they do for their secondary education. Thanks. Sorry, how are you going? Thank no you. Worries. Thank you. Welcome, Paul. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Paul, to catch you up, we are going through our uh, public public school strategy document. Um, and covering, we're touching on each of the core standards in a more open conversation around um, what it, kinds of things could further strengthen our school district. Mm -hmm. um, we moved the standards around a little bit to save a couple for our conversation to include you. No, thank you. Um, but we began with um, instructional leadership, providing every student with a rigorous aligned curriculum, effective instruction, and meaningful assessments that improve teaching and foster deep learning. Um, at this moment, we're talking about, um, you know, we've created some really great innovation pathways and early career um, options for students. Well, what are some of the things that we might be able to do to help students acquire technical skills, uh, some vocational skills without leaving Hopkins? Um, for the student parents who really want their students to have plumbing, electrical, carpentry, um, we talked about that in previous right. meetings. We're just revisiting it this time. Yeah. Yeah, and I love that you've introduced that idea before and I've heard the community ask about that. They're they're very passionate about it. Yeah. Our, our town needs it. And what I hear in the national conversation around home building, around manufacturing coming back, mm -hmm. around the skills, uh, the, the skills that are not going away. AI and machine learning are never gonna take away the need to mm -hmm. Two pipes together, yeah. wire something up, even if it's automation on a new um, car assembly line, um, or or to build the homes that our country desperately needs. So I, I work on offshore wind, and we're we're talking to high schools in the New York and Jersey area about pathways to get them developed, so that and then working with the colleges to get them the offshore wind technical training, and so. Not necessarily saying that that's what we want to do here, though I'll, I will say UMass is an is a international leader on offshore wind. But um, that type of electrician, 
the computer skills and it, it's renewable energy is one of the fastest growing industries in the country. It really yeah. is. And so it's just something that those things tear quite nicely to that. I really do. I will say, I, I'm very proud to say that I ran into a former student of mine and um, he had gone into electrical, but he's actually heading to a program in Oklahoma to learn how to do uh, he's a you know certified electrician. He's learning how to work with the wind technology. That's great. Um, yeah. And I just happened to run into him, and I'm you know, just so proud of yeah. of how well he's done. Uh, yeah, it was it was you know it's one of those teacher moments when you really you know get excited because you're you're happy that your kids have done that, you know been successful. So yeah. It's hard for us to see that far down the horizon of where our students are and what they're experiencing. But Ethan, you put it well. The cost of a higher ed uh, education is is not reducing anytime soon. No, it's not. The jobs that our students are getting I just are the bill. increasingly technical yeah. in nature and not coding necessarily. In fact, those coding jobs are really at risk. We talked about AI and how your science majors are kicking themselves for their four years of your science degrees coming out of Stanford, even because AI asked ChatGPT to build you an iPhone app. Right. We'll do that for you. Yeah. We like to lead in Hadley. And I think it's important for us to think about the ways that the world is changing and adapt our offering to what that need is. A lot of schools aren't going in this direction, but I think I think it's crucial for us to think differently about the vast majority of students coming through public schools in our region and lacking that technical mm -hmm. training. And we're not talking about replacing their education with this. We're talking about augmenting the education with some strong technical training. I think a lot of students would go for it. And so, I have to say that part of it is too, just uh, kids learning how to fix things so that they don't have to, you know, almost be afraid to, to touch a saw because they've never used one before or they don't know the difference but you know between different wrenches but you know it's no different than a you know my kids the first two were lucky they had home ec john never you know we didn't have that and at least my first my first two can cook dinner yeah. somewhat um or write or, or write a check that one my, my husband just blows his mind when they don't know how to you know yeah write a check or things like that. Mm -hmm. And I think we kind of left some of those, you know, things behind that, you know, that, that every, you know, the, the skills that you need to survive when you get out of school, where they don't, you know, they're, they're, they're well, and, yeah. and it's not surprising because most of our manufacturing jobs left. And so we didn't have that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now we're reskilling, we're bringing semiconductor manufacturing back. We're like, that is not going to change. We are never going to be dependent again on other countries for that. We have a green economy that is, you know, without it, we're just not going to reverse the course of our planet. And so we have to double down on that. The jobs of the future are these jobs that are technical in nature. And I think inspiring our students to see themselves as technical technically capable mm -hmm. is something that we are, it's more like incumbent upon us to evaluate and understand what that looks like mm -hmm. today. And I think it's difficult for the kids because they feel like, you know, a lot of kids don't feel like they get the same respect when they go to a vocation school. Mm -hmm. And that has to change because, yeah. you know, this is, uh, they may not be able to, you know, handle comparative lit, but um, at least they can get from place to place because I can do comparative lit, but I can't fix my car. Well, I was going to say they can't do comparative <laughs> lit, but they have a eighty-five, ninety thousand dollars job. Right. Pay. You know, like, I mean, I'm just, yeah, yeah. Again, it comes back to that value. Thing. Right, right. So I think um, the more we can do. And maybe talking to some alumni. We one thing I know, you know, a lot of my my 
high school reaches them, they do a lot with alumni and it's a Catholic school, so always hitting us up for money. So, but maybe, you know, finding a way to get feedback from our from the alumni to, you know, tell us what they see happening out there, what they wish they had or were thankful that they had, you know, what, what helped them the most and is there something more um, because they're the closest to it. I think it's an excellent idea to reach out to our alumni and I think our alumni don't get any surveys. So I think the first ever alumni survey yeah. of what they're doing, where they are, what they wish they would have known, what kinds of additional education they went on to undertake after Hadley and why, um, what they wish. Yeah, all, all those things. It's a resource to our yeah. current students. I mean, oh yeah, right. to be open to a mentorship conversation with a current student. Yes. Okay. Excellent idea. Mm -hmm. that is they do idea. that at the college level. I mean, right. absolutely. It, so it would be fantastic to have. I mean, we get phone calls all the t all the time from college students to talk about what mm -hmm. we do in our careers after we've graduated. That would be fantastic yeah. mm -hmm. to be able to associate somebody. And there's so many alumni in Hadley. I'm sure that would be absolutely so happy to talk well, about what they did. Who left? And who are doing yeah. incredible things right. elsewhere. So yeah. just connecting them back and yeah. having, you know, nurturing their Hadley identity yeah. by way of it. On the right. vocation, did you get into any of the hows? Um, no, we're... Not that we have to. Let's, let's take a moment to talk about some of the hows in a, I would say, in a generative way. We're still in the open sure. phase of the conversation. Um, so one thing I shared, Paul, before you got here is that some of the things that are in the pipeline right now are two additional. So uh, we did get the grant to do, which is not a technical, but a trade um, partnership with Hatfield and Granby in a Pioneer Valley Public um, Safety Academy. So mm. we'll be working with their public safety and our okay. public safety and formalizing many of these internship opportunities that Hopkins students have really enjoyed in public safety. We're in the planning stages of a computer science innovation pathway. So we were invited to apply for a planning grant for that. Um, and we also have applied for a computer science um, grant or that would be more looking at how we are teaching computer science. And when I'm saying computer science, I don't just mean coding, but very broadly speaking, yes. tech technology, mm -hmm. um, how we're teaching in digital literacy, how we're teaching that K through 12. So I haven't heard back on that grant yet. We also were invited into a planning grant and there were very few districts invited into this, a clean energy innovation pathway. I'm so grateful that you mentioned mm -hmm. that about UMass because it's part of writing the planning grant. Oh yeah. Only to reach out to higher ed partners. Yeah, and local. I so can, I'm happy to help with that. Yeah. That would be really helpful. Um, so that would create an innovation pathway in clean energy. Um, something else that's useful, I was writing down as I was listening to all of you, um, just thinking about how do we more specifically identify and structure opportunities for career awareness, particularly in technical education. So that career awareness, as we were talking about, inviting alumni in job fairs, um, field trips that are focused on tech ed. Exploration is more um, maybe short-term job shadowing and career immersion internships. The state budget this year, the state budget that was just passed um, in apprenticeships and internships, and this also includes adult, higher ed, and um, but also high school, they increased the line item for apprenticeships and internships it was 1 million in fiscal year 23, and it was increased to 3.8 million in fiscal year 24. This is absolutely um, yeah, a priority of the administration. Early college high school was increased from 10 million to 15.2 million in the state budget, and innovation pathways and career tech ed is in, well, IP was increased from 4.8 million to 5.9 million. I bring up the apprenticeships because I can certainly reach out to Senator Comerford and Rep. Carey and ask them some questions about what the language is in those lines and is possibly could um, high schools that are not traditional tech high schools start 
partnering with people to have apprenticeship opportunities for students or that, as you said, so students don't necessarily have to choose, but they could explore the trades in a meaningful way, right? Um, and set themselves up if they fell in love with it and then wanted to go directly from an apprenticeship perhaps into new training. Right. But those those figures in the state budget are very telling and I just wanted you guys to be aware of that. Any other comment on the, the how that you wanted to highlight? No, I guess I haven't thought through. I mean, personally, like, do we send our students to a Smith folk to share or do we do some alternate? It sounds like we have different angles for some of the technical training. One idea that's been floated to me is a, a model of a shared services where you have a lot of area schools uh, Amherst, even Northampton, uh, Granby, Smith, who uh, don't want to pay $20,000 and send their, their student completely to Smith folk, but rather augment maybe half a day on a given right. week or a day of the week. I don't know how the scheduling would work out, but we are on the bus lines. We're like graced with being right on a main artery for the PPTA. Um, we we have the old hooker school right next to our building so that is potentially infrastructure that we could potentially look at to build out an electrical lab a plumbing lab a carpentry lab that our students could just walk over potentially um and there's other spaces not just that one people might have their sights set on that one for other things Okay, it is Russell. Thank you. I just said Russell. Russell. Yeah, Russell. Yeah, it's Russell. Um, but there are other buildings also in that vicinity that we could also look at. Look at, but those are some of the things that I've heard parents say. It's like, what about a shared services where our students could just go over and take some of those classes at some point in the day, and then have an internship or apprenticeship with a plumber or a company that has a you know in-house plumbing department or electrical department what i can certainly agree with that the school committee it sounds like this is a priority so some of the information i can't guarantee i'd have it all sitting before you in september but certainly this fall so i can bring back for you certainly when those planning grants are put together so you see that direction for computer science and for clean energy um i can do some research on these apprenticeships and that that language that's in the state budget for this year and what might be available. We are seeing this Pioneer Valley Public Safety Academy as a potential pilot or prototype for other mm -hmm. that that we would kind of work some kinks out and then see what else we could build from there. And that's for that's based um I'm sorry again that's for public safety training type. Yeah I could I could tell you my my son's much that yeah I love that yeah so um, and so I can, I can dig deeper into those, um, and bring that information back to the school committee and kind of lay out what some of that might look like in concrete process and outcomes that we can involved. That would be great. Mm -hmm. I would say take a couple of months to figure out what could be possible and then bring that back to us in the fall. Yep. Great. This is something that won't come together overnight. But I'm afraid if we don't talk about it, we'll never get there. Well, and I also appreciate when we bring this up because certainly people are viewing. So thank you, Alex. Um, but they can see that these things are, we are moving the ball down the field. So these innovation pathways, these all of these opportunities, we keep building on these. And we talked about a shared services model, and now we have been selected and funded by the state to try to do this with two other communities. So we are, we are moving in that direction. Excellent. Okay. Um, well, let's. Should we switch again, or should we just keep going for now? Say that to the end. Um, no, 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 no. I, I was just. Asking get to release about... this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we're gonna switch here. We're, we're gonna release you. Okay. <laughs> so it's a fine. You did. You did vote while you weren't here. Call your. I did not vote. Your colleagues voted to move business services in house. And I just. Yeah. Nice. 
Chris Pip did ask him if he wanted the two. He actually wanted it. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That must be I don't know. It's going to be one of the, bad. yeah, one of those, you know, awkward composal denials on television. television. You know. <laughs> well, now do we get to show him the secret engine? <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I'm here. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, boy. So, uh, so this is the second item of business that we've waited, Paul, for you to. Yeah, we're sure we wait until you get here. To Thank you. So we um, had a meeting this afternoon with the designers for the athletic fields. Um, we've been kind of accumulating several requests for change orders, um, and they are all included on this report. Um, I can go over them if, if you'd like, just to kind of fill you in on the reasons for them. Um, I think that would be helpful. Um, you can see basically, you know, the, the amount at the bottom far right, a million five forty six is the amount that we've received for the project um, the low bid at the top of a million 297 we knew there were going to be some adjustments like the well for example um, we need another well we can't service all of the fields with one well we need two of them for that so we knew that one was coming um, a big change is the sod so uh, the athletic director has been trying to find alternate fields to be used next spring for baseball and softball and uh, has not had a lot of success actually trying to find locations to play. Um, so one of the thoughts was if we used sod in the field, it would obviously be pretty much instant grass, you know, and then all you would need is time for the roots to kind of dig into the soil and it would be playable. Um, obviously that was not in the original um, plan that we had. So it's $145,000 um, to add the sod and basically replace the um, hydro seeding that they were going to do with sod. Um, the well, as I said, $55,000. Sir Chris, just that the sod, which shows just as a cost, it in there, there's the subtraction of the hydro seeding. Yeah, it was 158 and change. So it was going to cost about $12,000 for the hydro seeding. Uh -huh. Sod is, as you know, significantly more. Gotcha. Um, the well, um, that was something that was kind of, it was in the specs, but apparently it wasn't um, like a positive thing in the specs. It was a little bit confusing to bidders. And we reached out to them. A couple of them put it in the bid. A couple of them didn't. Um, and they weren't quite sure if it was supposed to be included or not. Um, we actually checked with the state on this. Uh, Omasta's bid was significantly lower than the second lowest bid. And uh, we checked with the state and, you know, geez, some, some did, some didn't include it. And, and we were told, well, the difference between the two bids was far beyond the price of the well. So you could still go ahead and do it. So yeah. that one we knew was coming. Um, the third item, additional walk uh, paving. So a as part of the kind of um, adjusting the phase one fields, we need to put a one foot drainage pipe underneath where the walkway was already paved. Um, and so to do that, they have to dig up the, the pavement. Um, and so all the way around, not all the way around. Um, and so th that's, that's why some of these really needed explanation. I see. Um, this particular item, what they were going to do was kind of dig it up right where they were going to put the, the, uh, pipe underneath and then repave all the way to the end of it so um and the reason for that is because they didn't want to have a number of you know 10 foot patches um here and there that that might cause a bump or something for people walking you know they they wanted to have it just smooth um and so that's that's the extra cost for that particular item um retaining wall where the bleachers are going uh, so the elevation of the project required that the fields be i mean uh, the the ground near the bleachers be graded um, on a downward hill um that was going there was going to be a change order for that as well it was going to be about nine thousand dollars so we took a look at it and decided really that it might be better just to have a retaining wall which comes out five feet goes along about 20 feet and then comes back out five feet and the bleachers would be tucked in um, to that retaining wall, it, it just was thought that would be better than having the ground kind of slope down to the bottom of the bleachers and that, that might cause puddling and stuff like that. So um, 
that was the reason for that change order. Geogrid under concrete. So they did uh, 15 test bores on the site. Um, and basically, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but you basically see all the layers of whatever's under the ground. They went eight feet down, and in none of those test bores did they find a layer of clay until they dug the hole for the <laughs> concrete pad where the concession stand is going to uh, go, and there they hit the clay. That's kind of an unstable surface for concrete to be put on. Um, so they wanted to put this... I'm not really sure what it's like. It's 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 basically like a, a grid that they put underneath, and it kind of stabilizes the ground. Um, that's that's relatively cheap at two thousand dollars. And and again, we went over all of these, and you know, my thought on that one was I would really hate to skimp on a two thousand dollar change order mm -hmm. and have cracked concrete in a year. You know, so um, drainage revision revisions. So we're adding some additional drains to the field. As you know, we had some real drainage problems last year in the far corner of the field. Um, that was the phase one project. Um, so we're adding some additional drains as well to that. Um, additional gravel under concrete. So again, where the um, concession stand is going, the ground was going to be sloping from the parking lot down to the concession stand. Uh, and when we walked that last week, Fred Siaglo and I were out there and we looked and the concern was that we were going to have this pad of concrete with a hill coming down from the parking lot. And again, we'd have water just puddling outside of this uh, stand. So uh, we actually met with Omasta, you know, we, we leveled it all off. We needed to add several inches to, to bump that back up. So um, they're going to raise it by 11 inches basically yeah. to make it so it's slightly above the parking lot rather than uh, below it. And that mirrors the increase in elevation of the concession stand too. Right? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Can I ask a, just a really silly question? Yeah. With all this money we're spending on the concession stand, couldn't it go somewhere else? It it definitely could. I I don't I don't I I'm perfectly fine with what we're doing here. I just yeah. I'm just uh, I'm just gonna ask the question. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, this is going to be for you guys to decide. Yeah. You know, if you want any. It says or... right other place to put it. You got to bring power there. Um. Uh, yeah. I'm. No, I'm with no, you. I'm just thinking. Just thinking. Now, like two thousand is cool. Eight thousand, and then. Another eight thousand for the increase. Now we're at eighteen, nineteen k for the concession stand. There's really not a great other place to put it. I mean, you'd want it where the yeah. people can get to it. You want it where you have power. Yeah. No, I'm. I, I'm just. I'm just. You know, like you said, two k. I wouldn't want to mess with that. That's nothing. But right. you know, there's two other line items. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did bring up something like you know behind the retaining wall. Um, you know, they said we we'd like to put some of the geo grid behind that as well, and. You know, there was a little difference of opinion on whether or not it was necessary, um, you know, between the designers and the contractor. And, and I just asked them, well, how much are we talking here? And he said $150. And I said, well, you know, I mean, I don't like to waste $150 like anybody else. But I said, you know, my God, if we can spend $150 and that pretty much makes sure that the wall's not going to tip over, then mm -hmm. by all means, let's do that, you know. Um, so clay bricks on baseball and softball fields. So this was something that uh, Jeff Mish was telling us for a long time. The you know basically the batters dig in in the batter's box and before you know it he's constantly filling these holes because they keep digging in and the dirt comes out and you know you try to rake it and it's it's a lot of work and um, this was something that Fred mentioned I was unaware of this but you know I guess and the you, pitching mound too right pitcher's mound too yeah same deal yeah, so you know where the first one. where the where the pitcher's foot lands after a while and I know this from experience that your whole your, your foot yeah. creates a hole and before you know it you're really dropping down. Um, and so they put these bricks about four inches under the soil, and that way it's pretty much your limit. You're not going any further down than the bricks, you know. I'm surprised um, they're so expensive. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Well, we're we're doing, you know, of course, there's two baseball fields, two softball fields, and it has to be at the pitcher's mound and the sure. uh, home plate on both sides of home plate for each one. So, a lot. Um, I mean, still, you know, you'd be surprised at how, how costly some of these items are, but yeah, uh, that's on there. Uh, the concession stand elevation now, you know, now that it's raised up, of course, you have to fill in all around it and, and grade it accordingly. So there's uh, that amount here. Um, install sand under varsity fields. So, again, with the whole drainage problem we had last year, and, uh, you know, we've met numerous times about this, and and we know how important it is to get this right, you know. So this is, this is um, on both 
um, phase one and phase two. So we would, we would remove um, additional soil from the phase one infield, dig out three more inches of clay that, that is there and put three inches of sand, then the infield mix on top of it. So that would allow for increased drainage. And, you know, so if you take the size of an infield and, and have three inches of drainage around the whole thing where the sand can kind of absorb the, the water, mm. um, you know, you get much better drainage versus it goes through the infield soil, hits the clay and sits there. You know, I mean, it's, it seems to be something different because we're removing a heck of a lot of sand, right? We're, we're removing the infield mix that Not they the put same. in. Then we're removing the clay that's right under it. And actually we went out there with a shovel and, you know, you dig you, it's like three or four inches down and you're hitting the clay. Okay. I mean, it's I'm just looking at all the across the fields. There's, I thought the top layer they're taking off is mostly sand. I guess what I'm saying is they can't use the, some of the other material they're removing to do that. I would guess not. I can certainly ask, but I mean, it's Wait, worth asking. If it's yeah. Busy. What are they doing with that? They I mean, why can't they reuse? It. Yeah. It's a heck of a lot. I mean, if you've been watching it, they've been taking a lot of Yeah. Something to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know that it's sand they're removing. Right. Um, uh, that's but yeah, but right. um, I, I can certainly ask anyway. Um, and, and again, you know, removal of materials from the varsity field. So they have to dig up all this infield mix, the clay, and, and all of that stuff and truck it away. So yeah, you, know, you see that's $18,000. Um, the next two items see, are... That's surprising. Yeah. That, not just the cost, but it wasn't, why wasn't that factored? To, to the original, original bid. bid. Yeah. Um, it was factored in if it was just the infield soil. They're removing the grass as well. And this is also for the new fields that were not, it wasn't in the plans for the new fields. It was actually in the plan for one baseball field. Huh. Now they're doing it in phase, in the phase two section as well. Again, just to ensure that we have, okay. um, you know, adequate drainage. Um, so bullpens, uh, basically, we thought it would be a good idea to actually have at each field a, a place where, you know, a pitcher can warm up off, off of the field. Yeah. Um, and so my only comment on those is where they're putting them might be where if we end up doing geothermal, I just want to make sure there's not a conflict there. Okay, so it's the area behind the gym. A little square piece of land. I think that's where Fred was thinking about putting. Well, they're putting one at each field, so they would be spread throughout the the entire project. Um, you know, for example, like at the far corner where the JV baseball field is, you would have one in the sidelines there. Yeah, but on the, where the new varsity baseball field is going to be. Yeah, I didn't think there was space there to, between that and the um, path. So I thought Fred was talking about putting it behind. Which well, is, for that one, it probably makes sense to, to put it there. But yeah, it might be something to talk about. So, and I don't know what we need for the ground source if we end up we going there. That clear. Sorry. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Well, I have just it. to see. I mean, I maybe I they're there and I haven't seen it, but just kind of see what all this looks like in picture form. We really need it approved or disapproved tonight. I can tell you. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's it's one of those things. If we wait until September, we might as well shut it all down for the year. You know. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's yeah really. Um, I'm <laughs> saw it down in time for soccer this year. Not for soccer this year. Okay, no. For baseball next year. Yeah, for baseball in the spring. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I have a picture of what. So the... with the sod, I can try a question now. Too. Like, if we found baseball fields in December, when are we putting that sod down? Are we putting it down in the spring, or are we putting it down in the fall? I think they went. It would be put down as soon as possible. Fall. Fall. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because you need the roots to be able right. to dig in. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so otherwise. You'd have kids, you know, cutting a corner or something while they're running, and whoops, you know, just now. Yeah. Imagine your cat no, in the you. house and hitting that carpet, and the whole thing goes flying when they take a corner. That's, I'm all, I'm right there, I'm right like there. there with you. I'm supportive of the bullpens. It just, uh, I can, we can talk to Fred about where he's thinking about the. the yeah, um, it, it might be tricky for me to get a Wi-Fi signal out here. Um, they did send drawings for all of these things the other day. Not spot. Were they not planning on having bullpens? It wasn't in the original plan. It yeah. wasn't in the original. Do you need to ask Fuzzy again? Hmm? Like, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I'll do this. I'll do this. Would anyone like another? I'm going to grab some. Take a scotch. Yeah. 
Uh, well, we have other stuff. Oh, I have, and I have dessert. I'll get the dessert out. And we have we have the fruit. So, yeah, I'm gonna grab a diet coke. So ultimately, Chris, you're saying with all these changes, we're 78 grand over yep. the allocation. Yeah. Jeez. And I will say that Chris went through the 10 year capital plan that identified all of the expenses that we had in FY23 that we had indicated that the funding source would be school choice. But due to, I would probably say primarily due to the fact that we received so many grants last year many of those expenses we were able to take out of the operating budget. So all of the $78,000 would be funded through school choice funds that were set aside for capital in FY23 that we didn't use. Yeah. Is that I mean, correct, Chris? That is correct. Yeah, I have that report here to hand out um, afterwards. But yeah, we did a bunch of uh, the items on the capital plan and none of the school choice items hit the school choice account. They all were, we absorbed them into the regular budget. So. I mean, my take on this is, we got a very low bid from Amasta. And if our estimate from a, ultimately probably a year ago that it was 1.5 million, 1.5 and a half, and now we're at 1.6 and, and a quarter, it's a pretty darn good yeah. estimate for these days with inflation. Can I ask a question about the credit for net elimination? Yes. Just what, what we're getting rid of the net? Not so the net. as part of... <laughs> this project has been quite a, a, a moving target, I guess. Um, but, you know, once we took a look at where everything was situated, one of the things that was noticed was that we had, um, say, it was the softball field, then the player's bench, then the walkway, and then the mm -hmm. bleachers um, in between, well, with the walkway in between the bleachers and the bench. And it just seemed like... Boy, that's that's not a, a great place to have people walking by all all during the game while people are trying to watch. So we ended up moving everything over um, the field and the bench and the bleachers, so that now the walkway will be behind. It's going to be behind everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and so what that did was it moved the field far enough where, again, you know, if it was a baseball, you'd be concerned, but not with a softball, it's not going to reach the yards anymore. Okay. So that freed up. Thirty-six thousand dollars and change that we would have, and it also freed, freed up a kind of a big headache. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, that was the other thing we would have had to take them down every fall, put them up every spring. Yeah, and yeah. they wouldn't look great. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, and and it makes probably the walkway be more accessible and probably be nicer. Yeah, right. When there's yeah. a game going, Instead you have of, to right. be on alert all the time. Yeah, yeah. still have to be a little bit, but. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make sure I've captured the um, Chris's to-do list. I captured mine on standard one. This so uh, Chris. I heard that we want to see if um, asked the question about repurposing the sand that was dug up, if that's possible, and to make sure that this won't interfere with ground source geothermal should we choose to go in that direction. And I can talk to Fred about this and or Chris and we, you know, we can go over, but um, I know that I'd seen bullpen designs, I think, but I'm not sure if I saw the location. Yeah, I'm looking for that now. I. <laughs> I know on Friday there were probably 40 emails um, oh, yeah. about this project, so finding the one is the tricky part. But I will say thanks to you, Chris, for shepherding this. It's a lot of work, mm -hmm. and thanks to, to Fred Seagula, too. I think that's... Well, Fred has been so valuable for yeah. this. Um, you know, he has a knowledge of... Uh, Baseball. Of, of, of yeah. the fields, basically, yeah, right. you know. Um, and so that, that has been super helpful. Let's see. Yeah, he's... Get a, get a, get a, yeah. I like the sod idea, not just for the timing, that'll get it faster. I, I, you think you'll get a better product sooner. I mean, you'll get a thicker grass. And yeah. So all this, if we approve, all this would happen this year. Do Are they talking about timelines at all? Yes, that, that is still the goal. Um, I mean, yeah. Just why we we're, we're at a crunch right now. So this would be this entire project, bullpens, field, yeah, concession, yeah. all done this fall. That's, that's awesome. great. That's amazing. Still looking. I keep seeing follow-up emails, <laughs> of which I've opened <laughs> several now, and they're all, it shows what files were attached. I need to find the original one. 
does this cost also does this um does this cover all that is needed to set up the concessions no it's just the foundation so this is just the foundation yeah. this is not actually the actual concession stand no and that's not a, something that cpa money could have been used for okay so then we're, we are still going to do project all come together we set it up so that we get to decide if we want to build a facility if we want i mean we'll have mm -hmm. power out there we won't have <laughs> swimming Untitled. i don't think there'll be plumbing out there so <laughs> and we then you know don't have to a restroom out there and, mm -hmm. but lots of future possibilities okay so, Ned, so it'll be large so you could possibly put uh, facilities restroom facilities uh, i don't think there's plumbing we'd have to plumb it we would have to plumb it they're, they're bringing power out okay and there'd be enough room is that right chris did i get that right they are bringing power out yeah but not plumbing um plumbing to the fields as well they are yeah so we can water down the infield no but that's the well but not like uh, plumbing to the concession stands for uh we're having one rest, line for, for each electrical okay. and plumbing but not not, that stuff. not for restrooms it would be yeah. more for if you wanted a sink there yeah. or something right restrooms you then you then have to put sewage in and yeah. that's not in this phase so. yeah right it's piece Hmm? Piece by piece. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Phase two. Phase three. Bite your tongue. The final countdown. If there's a phase three, maybe I want to rethink my. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you didn't talk about phase four yet. Yeah. I'm yeah. looking here. He sent three drawings, but they're not showing where they're going. Phase three is the age pack. Yes. Yeah, I don't I don't have a detail in here, at least that I can find. Um so I'm happy to follow up, Chris, when we can talk to Fred. So the the only concern I had about the bullpens was that one on the varsity. So the varsity field as it is now will be turned 180 degrees and sort of it's the where the home plate will be behind that is that square that's right by the gym that's unused. Mm -hmm. That's where I would figure we would do the test wells for the geothermal. I would imagine that it would be somewhat unsafe to put anything back there that is out of sight, like putting a bullpen back there. In terms of student safety, um, I don't think we'd want it to be behind the school. I think we'd want it to be where it's visible, where coaches can see their kids warming up in the bullpen, uh, for instance, right? So that would sit right behind the... It would essentially backstop, right? it'd be yeah. it would be behind like uh, the backstop and or the, the bench where the players yeah. are. Um, it would be in that area, yeah. Um, and with a small fence as a backstop, so you know, yeah, those several wild pitches as the pitcher's kind of dialing it in. Um, they don't have to keep chasing the ball. Yeah. yeah. So I think it would be good to pass this, and uh, you know, I'd be willing to entertain a motion to approve this, but I think it would be good to um, stipulate that. No um, field project will improve upon the behind the gym area where we may. Yeah, I'll have to, to walk but that we, over just to see what we have. We have a little gap that seems a little stronger. It might be the only place. And that's why we're in. So if there's a way that we just keep it to the side, or I just need to. Or, or I guess the other question is, do we need a bullpen right away in for that field? Exactly. We did talk about that as well. That was a, another discussion this afternoon. The problem with it is, I mean, you know, just say we were to cancel the bullpens for now. So now we have just grass there, basically. Now you got to bring equipment across the right. grass, across the field, to dig up the grass and you know a little further down so then they can put sand and then the infield mix and but regulate the you know, where that could happen at our next meeting the bullpens the vote for the bullpens could happen at our next meeting and still meet this timeline or just one bullpen and again like i'm no i hear you saying it has to happen. Yeah, my concern I, is the mobilization demobilization costs will increase if we wait right and it's just i mean we have folks ready to do it now and we have a torn up field rather than have them come out my only i mean i'm personally i'm supportive of adding it now, I think it's the most cost efficient thing. My only concern is where we put it. But I know Fred was concerned in that where that new field is going to be, you're you're right on the path. Right. You're right up against it. Yeah. Yep. That's all. But so we can sit down and talk and I actually don't know the dimensions. I'd seen the specs. Mm -hmm. So we could go out and walk the dimensions. I don't know what we need for the geothermal. I don't know if we need that whole back field. If it's two hundred wells, I don't know how they're I spaced. I just want to be cognizant of protecting it. 
um, yeah. you know, we, it, wouldn't it be a shame if we couldn't do that project we had because we had now installed? Well, we could always take it out the bullpen, right. which is not cost effective either. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't want to interfere. I, I want to be able to do the ground source. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I guess, you know, really what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to just, we're meeting again with the contractors on Wednesday and the designers. So we'll, at that point, we can walk out back, take a look at the fields and say, hey, you know, we're going to need room for this as well. Um, I'm surprised we just don't know how much room. That, that's or the problem. we're actually going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, yeah. All those things will happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. we need to just authorize the money we're going to have a backstop i mean a, a bullpen we know that just not where well we're, we're so going to have most of the things we're going to have sod we're going to have right. well we're going to have most all of these things how would you like to so um <laughs> yeah so, okay, that's something that i would like to read the bullpen and it isn't that in we're, we're meeting in september right or is this, is this an all or nothing? But we, I'll, I'll tell you what I really look for is approval for everything. And I can ask them if we can wait on the bullpen. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, like I won't mention that everything got approved, but I'll just say uh, we're looking to wait on the bullpens until September. Well, and, we and in that, theory, you know, it'd be just one bullpen, right? Like just the varsity boys bullpen right. is going to occupy that space, right? It's not all the other bullpens are going to be put in in separate areas, right? Right. That is that is true. Yeah, they'll all be next right. to their next respective to their field. fields. So yeah, one bullpen for each team. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's just right. the yeah, one. All but the, bull, the boys' bullpen. But I think we vote it all in, and then, yeah, if, if yeah. we need to, if we I, can I think that's cross that bridge when we get back. Yeah, I guess if you ask them to wait so we can come with designs and review it. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I, I'd love to actually see, you know, where and and there may have yeah. been a drawing sent to me, but like I said, uh, Friday alone, I must have gotten 50 emails about okay. this. So, trying to find yeah. that particular drawing that was sent sometime in the last week, okay, on the fly, <laughs> it's tricky. So we'll know then by September. So I mean, I I know we haven't made an official decision about geothermal, but it sounds well, like that's we won't know. We won't know where it's going to go for months. How much space we need. Right. So then when we come back in September, we're not going to know any more information. We'll have an idea of where this will be. Maybe I mean, we could try to find out a little bit, like, what's the square footage for 200 weddings? Yeah. We could, I would just want to yeah. not do absolutely anything that impedes us from doing that energy project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as long as we have dedicated space to that, we're sure. And I, don't, I really don't know how much space is out there. I, I can't remember. It's, we should walk in. Yeah. yeah, that's why, you know, like I said, I, I would look for approval for them and I can ask if we can hold off on it. And if at the very least, walk behind the school with Fred and Jeff and the designer and get a better look on, yeah. you know, where it's going to be and how much room we actually have in it. So, um, yeah. you know, I mean, at this point, yeah, we have to kind of juggle to one project that's known and one that's not and make sure the other one's still possible. So. Okay, so we have a plan. Or can I make a motion to approve? Please do. Do I have a second? This budget. Okay, so we're approving this and we're asking you to be aware of what the plans are so that they're not yes. approaching on the backfield so that we can protect it for potential geothermal use. Yes. yes. Sand and wells. Sand. And let's ask, you know, we can ask, um, <laughs> I guess we'd ask every source about just rough square footage. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Can we? Do you mind shooting an email about to that? Effect? Oh, absolutely not. Yeah, I, I can do that tonight, tonight, tomorrow. Yeah. Um. Well, I think you're good. Okay. We have to do an all in favor. All in favor. Aye. 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 Um, um, can you go for just a bit? Absolutely. Yeah. The next item is management operations to okay. uh, talk. A bit about our HVAC conversation. Sure. Had, as well as another possibility. Summarize. I thought we had a really productive call the other day with Eversource. Sarah Ross was on from Undaunted K 12, which is a nonprofit that helps schools transition to lower carbon footprints. Um, I thought she gave a really good presentation on bringing in all the federal and state incentives. I mean, we're just really lucky to have so much government money, both in the state of Massachusetts and federal money to incentivize things like this. And so it really changes the picture in my mind from what would be a fairly costly project with ground source heat pumps um, to make it actually super competitive financially. Um, so 
the because you basically get 50 percent off tax credit essentially uh, direct payment to schools for uh, the ground source heat pumps and then there was an additional incentive from the state so where we seem to have left it right was um we're going to come back in our september meeting and um, talk about voting to for them to do a further defined study yes which so they people would also have the opportunity exactly. to work on it and also to reach out to school committee in advance yep yeah, thank mm -hmm. you and i think that further divine study there was a cost for it but there also seemed like there was so there was a cost of about thirty thousand dollars ten thousand of which would come um, from 70 30 so it's like how is that it uh, or from yeah. us from us. Yeah. so that would give us more specifications of what it was about four in four to five months we would have a lot of detail about right. one of those four pathways yeah that's great and if i can i would just be cautious on the four to five months <laughs> it seems to be you know, I mean, their first phase was one to two months and it was four, you know, so, and that was with a lot of chasing. So, um, yeah, I, I just think, you know, those are probably best guesses, but it's going to take a while. You know, expect that they may continue yeah. further. That's all. But yeah. as you have in here, right, in our 10 year capital plan, we've got, we, we know we have to do something with the HVAC system. Yeah, it's on here. So, yeah. yeah. And so this idea of transitioning into something that's a uh, lower carbon footprint that um is heavily subsidized by federal and state money there's there's a lot of compelling things we need to see the actual data uh in addition though humara and, and and i were talking about well uh, is there a way also to couple that because what that all increases our electricity demand um it'll eliminate our oil needs which are amazing um and so how do we offset that right there's also there's lots of incentives now for solar so that is something else so sarah ross said she was going to Put pull some information together. She used to be in the solar industry, um, so she's got a lot of connections. So she was going to help us just roughly flesh out what that might look like, something we can bring to a, a future um, school committee meeting discuss. Clearly, there's federal state money for that as well. I mentioned, you know, I think if we're going to put something that's going to be on a roof for 20 plus years, we're going to make sure we got a, a good roof. And I see here we've got 1.2 million set up for 2029. Uh, for a solar or replace membrane and the roof, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that's something we, we'd have to factor in. She did mention that there was some new state money that just came through a new state, uh, bill that was passed that provides money just exactly for that, for schools to redo their roofs for solar. Mm -hmm. So I don't know any more details, but again, this, we might be take climate change out, take fossil fuels, forget any of that and just talk about pure numbers. Yeah. So we can potentially, re ideally, if it all came together, what you're doing is you're putting on a new roof membrane, you're adding solar, either solar that we own or solar that somebody else right. owns and we're, we're purchasing. She's going to run both scenarios and then couple that with a ground source heat pump or some sort of electric system that gives us heating and cooling consistently across the gym and all the entire building. So it's, it's it'd be an amazing combination if we could flow together. Thank you, Paul, for yeah. um, raising the question and also um, asking Sarah to investigate for us. I've been very impressed with what she's been able to surface. Mm -hmm. yeah, she's, she's, she's really good. She's good. Um, and she's, we're so lucky to have her at the base on this. Definitely. Um, so I look forward to hearing from her. Um, yeah. Let us know. So that Maybe we can pull that together for the September meeting. Yeah, if we have it for the September meeting, we yeah. can definitely put it on the agenda and discuss it. And Sarah was planning on coming. Right. I was just in thinking of that. That September meeting, Monday the 25th, young Ford does not end until 6.45 p.m. Is it possible then to, do we want to consider moving that meeting to Tuesday the 26th if people were involved? Or they do not start yet? I prefer not to have it on that call. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Do we want to move it? it sure. ends. I didn't realize that when I scheduled it. Thankfully, have Jeff Janowski told me that Beyond the Pool will end Monday night, 6 5 p.m. Uh, so you're proposing Tuesday, Tuesday the 26th? Yeah, that works. It's Tuesday the 26th at 5.30. Can we get it born? I can do that. Okay. I think it's yeah. a worth, worthwhile endeavor to move it to a board. Yeah. yeah. That, okay, so I'll be asking Sarah to attend that meeting. Okay. And Sarah is working on it now. She emailed me today looking for some information on the roof. So um, I told her I'd put it together in the next couple of days and get it over to her. So we'll get that to her. And Ann, did you see the email they wanted to? Unless there's a policy meeting. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, would you have something? There was an email today asking if they could loop in another person into the project. I'll make sure I give them a date. I'll tell them that. I, uh, I can just respond to them. I, you were in that training all day, and I kind of held out to talk to you. Was that Eversource? Um, I think so, yeah. Don't you worry about a thing. They had someone else that was... Um, Thank you for that. Well, I was thinking of it. I'll play the same Are there any other comments about um, this item, management and operations, and ensuring a safe, efficient, effective learning environment for all students? I know we just... Um, um, uh, cameras, additional cameras in order to um, eliminate any uh, blind spots that were that emerged. Are there any other factors that fall into this area that we should cover? Hmm? Allergies. I do. Okay, seeing none. Uh, why don't I, I'm looking forward to our September meeting so that we can further discuss and maybe move forward on one of these pathways. Exciting. Um, okay, we're going to move next to um, the strategic objective C family and community engagement, we'll partner with families to meet students' academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs. Um, this is uh, perhaps yeah, our. Uh, so the area that we're, we uh, have worked uh, really hard to um, to excel at, and perhaps the area that uh, is still um, is in, in that Are you sure? I, I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm really excited to see that we this year we finally unveiled an equity dashboard. Kudos to you. Thank you for. Um, giving us a snapshot of data about equitable outcomes across the board and what it looks like and being able to measure that year up and year. I'm thrilled to see a survey and I'm excited to see when the results of the, the survey data might come in. Can you comment a bit about that? Sure, yeah. So we have the, we have our results in and what we're doing now is the Teams at each of those schools are looking at what are we seeing and what are the themes, and then putting it together. We're getting a chance for teachers and leadership teams at those schools to sit down together and say, "What are we seeing? Um, what are we? What do we think that we're doing, or what did we think we were doing to address or to enhance something, and what more might we be thinking we might need to do, and then to put together a resolution." Okay, very good. Thanks. Bye, Chris. Thank you. Sure. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Not every day I bring you an Indian food. Enjoy. Mm. Um, okay. What? I didn't know it was Indian. Oh, yeah. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's very healthy. Food approved. Yeah. Oh, just slightly. I like the word Indian food. Fantastic. <laughs> So that's really exciting that fall we'll see survey results and uh, you know, we work hard to buy the language and to see what we were able to surface from that. Uh, in circles that I've been navigating in academia and other K-12 environments, the word uh, belonging uh, is really rising to the surface as a key indicator as to whether or not we're doing the things correctly. Does every student feel a sense of belonging? Do they feel included? Do they, um, and, and what are we doing to be mindful and measure that? Um, and this is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. I know I've talked with other colleagues who have uh, been thinking about that as well. And I wanted to cr create some space for discussion about belonging. What does it look like when it happens really well? Um, and what are some of the aspects of our culture that we'd like to focus on for the next um, I may, I'm going to ask us to each share what does belonging mean to them? So if you will just go one at a time, think about it for a minute, and then share what does belonging mean to you? 
and um, I will start off. I've been thinking about this for a while. Belonging to me means feeling connected to the people around. So belonging to me, when I think of belonging, I think of the word home. I feel home. I feel if family, all family, togetherness. Uh, for me, I think it's feeling um, accepted and safe, both physically and emotionally. Um, and that, you know, comfortable to be your, welcome and comfortable to be your authentic self. Whoever's there in that moment. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. Thank you. I can add on that. It's, to me, it's sometimes also, it's, a, it's an absence of something. That, so that absence of feeling like you have to be guarded or feeling like you have to watch what you say. or um, And it's sometimes you don't even realize how comfortable you are. So it's like, you know, sometimes you don't, you're not aware that you feel like you belong until you get to a situation where you realize you don't belong. And then you, it's stark. You know? Um. Again, it's it's about being accepted, warts and all. It's about being able to make mistakes and not have, you know, a one you know one of my worst days be the the day that defines me because people you know, tend to do that. And so for me, it's being able to yeah be real with the, with the people around me and feel. They have my back, even when sometimes we not be, even if I'm not on the right track, they have my back. All this. Mm -hmm. uh, steal a lot of my stuff, but that's a, it's, <laughs> it's a spark to go early. Uh, it, the first thing that came to mind was uh, the ability to be your authentic self um, mm -hmm. in, in every situation, uh, every, every community that you find yourself in. Uh, knowing that you're safe or that you're accepted within that community um, and that that community that you're in is willing to engage in learning uh, when there is a situation that arises that uh, may be difficult for you or for some other member of the community um, that, that people are willing to come together and, and learn from those experiences. Thank you. Um, what everyone else has said, I also think of, uh, the, of being seen, of being valued. A feeling like when I show up in a space that there are people who genuinely want me to be successful. They want me to experience confidence and happiness and joy. If people take the time to look me in the eye, to greet me, to see me, and communicate that they care. Mm -hmm. So important. I'd like us next to put ourselves in the shoes of our students and think about the environments that our young people or our older kids at middle school and high school might traverse any day of the week. And if we could just describe like out loud some of those environments where they should feel a sense of belonging. I'll start first, uh, which is like the easiest one, yeah. classroom. Um, you know, as a, in a learning environment, I think it's imperative for the educator to have a heightened sense, creating a sense of belonging for each and every student. Um, so I'm going to say outside the classroom and at recess, each student should be able to come out there and exert their physical self and their mental self and feel that they have a place that they also feel as though they belong while they're on the recess. Recess first came to mind too after we get the classroom. Um, I'll also add lunch room, uh, snack time. I was just say cafeteria, um, athletic fields or extra or extracurricular, right? If you don't play athletics or mm -hmm. do athletics, it, should be it is music. 
for me, um, it has it would have to be the halls because it you know that's when you find the different age groups sort of interacting. That's where there are things that are you know can be said on the fly that you know there's no real there's really if there's no teachers around that's where there's a lot of drama that goes on because of cell phones because they're allowed in the halls and then things um so i think it's you know uh can be very tricky but it's also i i guess it's for me it's a, this is kind of a little bit of a strange question because I, you know, I teach in middle school, I see a lot of kids that they don't want to belong hmm. and they want to, you know, sort of, um, they're teeny, they are, they're hormonal, they are all over the place. You've got either some that have too many hormones or don't have two to rub together. And so for me, middle school, the sense of belonging is very difficult for kids. It's a horrible, you know, it is a constant movement of they don't know who they are yet. And they're being sort of, they're not sure who to listen to as to who they need to be. And so I think that, so when you have, you know, for me, the concept of belonging, because I was in middle school for so long, I have a, you know, I said, it's hard for kids. They they don't know what belonging at that age feels like because socially it's just an awful good time. That's all. That's you know, it makes it difficult. Cell phones may have um, illuminated me, oh. but I mean, think back to our own youth. I would say hallways, bathrooms, all those interactions, they always mattered a lot, um, be it in or out of the classroom. And the point taken that this is a tricky time, this is adolescence, people are changing, they're evolving, and also they're figuring out who they are and who, what, what kind of posture they want to take on towards one another, be it kind or bad. Um, so even still as educators, it's like that much more important for us to realize that they need a constant source of care love kindness and a, a firm sense that hey you belong here even if even if you don't want to be here we got you mm -hmm. and i would add to that i think i think in that time they are going through so much so many changes and trying to figure out their identity but i also think that be all belonging is kind of this idea of being accepted for who they are right just the idea that belonging for them could be this is who i am in this moment I would hope that the community would be accepting of that. And I think sometimes that's the challenge is we're like, belonging means this, and for them it may mean something else, right? And so as a community being open to um, To answer the school question, I don't know if there's a space because you guys have picked all of them, but <laughs> not all of them. What I was going to say is those spaces, and you mentioned the hallways, those spaces where teachers aren't always, the hallways, the bathrooms, mm. maybe the dark corner of the under library. The stairs. Under the stairs, wherever, it may, those spaces where mm. there isn't constant teacher eyes on kids um, where an off comment could be made or, you know, a kid may not feel as comfortable as they are as they in a classroom or in a gym, or whatever it may be. So just kind of those those spaces that we don't think about all the time because we're not in those spaces. And they find them. They certainly do. And that's where they do the things that they want to do that they don't want anybody to see. <laughs> whatever they want to say. <laughs> I don't think about a presenter that we had, I think, here, and it was so helpful. This person talked about what we all do. I've given this example to folks before. Again, it was hers. That if you, if somebody sends you in your email a, uh, what do you call that? Like, oh, the shutterfly. Like, here's an album. Here's an album with an event that you were just at. I think what most people do, here's what I do. I go through every single picture and make sure that I look good if I'm in, <laughs> right? I'm like, did somebody get me with a big piece of lettuce stuck in my tooth, my hair sticking up? Like just a quick, oh my goodness, do I look okay? And what this person said was, every child in every family who enters your schools, they're doing that. 
walls, it's on the textbooks, it's on the instructional materials. Do I see myself and do I look good? And by that look good, is that kind of like, you know, how am I being represented? Yeah, yes. well represented, right. Am I, exactly. Yeah. And that was really helpful. I know it, I believe I've had the elementary, perhaps at both of the schools, some of the teachers did this kind of like, let's walk the walls, let's walk our materials, let's see if somebody's walking through this like a giant photo album. Who's up? Who's in the photo album and how they look? But that's, I mean, that's so difficult when you're in such a small school. It's, it's very uh, common for there to be, you know, only one or two people that represent different groups because when you only have 40 in the class, that it, it's just, you know, the numbers, it's not a matter of, of that. And so I think that we're, you know, the fact that we're seven through 12 and, you know, we have the, the K through six, I think that our kids are better at, um, you know, realizing that they may not, you know, better at finding commonalities than finding differences. And it's, it's, that's, you know, something that is important for, um, you know, a lot of kids to understand that we can't change, you know, we, this is where we live. This is, we can't change this and they need, and we need to find ways to make it, um, you know, a place of commonalities and not of differences. You, you, just, you make yeah, up a really good point. point. Well, you make up a really good point. I want to, I think about this a lot about the small school and whether in theory, it could be easier to create a sense of belonging because you have a finite universe in a sense, right? So my question for us is, is belonging defined by differences in race? Let me There's no right answer. It's not defined. Differences in race? Not defined. I wouldn't say, but it, it influences it. It's been my experience. One of the factors. Yeah. I have to think about when you hear people when they go to prison, who do they sit with? It's heavily, exclusively racial, and why is that? And not to say we're a prison, it's just sort of, there's something about that that I think does lend itself to some underlying current of belonging that, um, it, it's not the defining factor, but it, there's some something there. I think it, to me, it, it, I think to ignore it would be to the detriment. Indeed, and at the same time, have you, um, heard of or seen instances of a Caucasian student feeling a sense of, of not belonging in our district? Due to race? A Caucasian student not feeling a sense of belonging. Sure. Because they're not feeling a sense of belonging. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I have a child who goes to a different school. I think of your child often. Sorry to say that, but he's a, he's a close, well, he yeah. used to be a really close yeah, friend. Yeah, my daughter yeah. Daughter. Yeah. I say they're still friends. Yeah, I would say so too. Yeah, but so yeah, that that's right. right. What does yeah. belonging mean? What does belonging mean? What does belonging really mean? Because I'm not talking about race. I'm I talking see. about all of us. Right. And there's there's race, of course. Then there's class. Right. Then there's like who's from Hadley. Mm -hmm. Those systems. Okay. There's that. that. I, I was waiting to get <laughs> there there to that part. There's the I mean, there's any number of different parameters. It isn't just about race, right? Yeah. And it's also based on assumptions. It's very much yeah. based on assumptions. And, you know, and that, um, you know, I'm sure that many people would be very, you know, shocked to find out that most farmers in this community have masters and have advanced degrees and, uh, you know, it's a business not just about milking a cow Indeed. that these are major businesses Indeed. and that um, what the assumptions that are made because oh well you're from hadley you know i i love that because i'm not they everybody thinks i am and because yeah. i'm married again but you so, know even reality the way know, you really, just mentioned it it was almost like pejorative oh you're from hadley yeah. i've heard it in the opposite Mm. Like, oh, you're not going to have All right. 
I've seen that. That's, that's a very. That, I mean, both of those things can be true. Yeah, both of those things can exist in this in this environment. So you know, when we you were asking about where people sit, one of the things that um, I studied microaggressions way back when when I was in college in um, sociology and this like I had mentioned being not being able to make mistakes that has become very um, obvious in across social media across news across everything that we don't the kids aren't allowed to make a mistake and when they feel that that's why you have people pulling to people who are familiar because they they're afraid of saying something it's very true and i used to deal i used to do this all these things with my with my middle school students in that you know um i just remember there was just one one student who we're reading a book we're reading a story and he comes to a part and he just looks up and he um say this i'm like why and he said well because can, can i say black <laughs> and i said um that's how it's written i said you know what what's and well is there a better way to say it? and i just turned around i looked at one of the students who happened to be said, do you have a problem with him saying that i said and did you why did you have a problem i said this is the problem. People are so afraid of making a mistake that they would rather just avoid. And they would rather, and instead of, you know, why can't it just be a, do you prefer this? How would you like this to be, you know, da, da, da. and that's where our kids are, you know, they're, they're so afraid of that whole, can the whole cancel. And we've had it happen in our community. Well, and there's where a lot. somebody was literally there; her whole life was destroyed. Absolutely, I'm very well familiar with that. Yeah, incident. there's so I would say there is a thing about schools. We say this in higher education all the time, looking down at K twelve environments. Hmm. About you know, you're teaching students to choose between A, B, C or all of the above, when in fact, there's a myriad of other possibilities, right? And, uh, and encouraging students, failure being something that, you know, you don't strive for failure, but don't be afraid of failure and don't diss your friend because they have failed at something or they're still trying at something. So a culture of acceptance in general is something that is what I've seen other many other schools strive for. Mm -hmm. um, you've had some recent experiences that you've been learning about. I'd love to give you an opportunity to share that. Yeah, so I, I talked with Timera um, recently just about kind of this sense of belonging. And I, I actually take, I think I take my perspective, not opposite, but it's not quite the same. So. Hadley, being small, right, it, it actually can be a great challenging community to fit into. Um, and I've had a lot of parent, a lot of parents just randomly and random conversations, you know, just you're out somewhere at soccer practice, at a friend's house, at wherever it may be. I've had random people um, in the district kind of approach me. I've had people from the high school approach me as well, uh, parents, um, just kind of talking about you know, their, their experiences or their concerns. Um, and, and one that struck me so much that I actually had, um, had the mom write something down and I'd like to share it with you if I, yeah. if I could. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've, I've specifically, um, um, I've specifically asked them to leave complete gender, any sort of identifying factors out of this in any way, shape or form. Um, partly because, not because I feel there's any penalization, that there's any concern for that, but for the fact that it, it doesn't matter. If we're talking about a sense of belonging, does it matter how old they are, what their gender is, where they live, 
um, what they believe in, what their religion is. It, it shouldn't matter. It's all on that perception and how they feel. And so this this particular um, parent, it, it, it struck me. So I'm going to read it. Um, I think Hadley Public Schools has so much potential, an amazing teacher-student ratio, excellent academic offerings, great campuses, and an incredibly dedicated staff. I also feel, as someone who wasn't born in Hadley, that my child is at a disadvantage socially and is treated like they don't belong at times. The remarkable thing to me is that many people seem to feel this way, even those from families that go back multiple generations. Moreover, as my child is seemingly cis and straight, neurotypical, white, middle-class, athletic, and does well academically, but still gets treated like an outsider, I worry about those students who are not in the majority. So I admire and greatly support the efforts to talk about this topic. I asked my child if they feel like they belong. They said, kind of. Sometimes the other students aren't very inclusive, but I feel like I belong when I'm playing with the other kids and we're not worrying about if we're playing with your friends or not, or just playing. They went on to say that kids with a lot of connections, quote unquote, they, that know a lot of people, quote unquote, can get more people to take their side. Quote, sometimes they're nice, but sometimes they're me. They're different because they feel like they have more power over them. For years, my child has complained about how unfair, those are her, their words, um, the sports at recess are with the same children acting as captain for not just days or weeks, but months or years. As research shows, re recess is so important physically and mentally, and it seems like the lack of intervention has resulted in unnecessary toxicity. As my child says, for example, quote unquote, they won't let kids join the soccer team at recess that aren't a relative or on a team with them. Years of this weighs heavily on them. My child doesn't like school. They have, to they have told me that for all the years they have attended, and maybe that's to be expected. It certainly is a popular theme in movies and books. But my child also loves learning, is obsessed with reading, works on materials at home, does their homework without asking, and gets mostly good reviews from their teachers. So I can't help but wonder if they had a more sense of belonging at school, whether they wouldn't dislike it or dread it going. I've considered changing schools from middle school to high school, like others before me who have left the Hadley Public Schools, are just too small and insular and clicky. So... I just found this really interesting um, because this person lives in Hadley, right? We're not even talking about race at this point. There, there's This is a white child who's moved into town. This child does really well academically. And on the outside, when I talked to this parent, I would have had zero idea that there was any worry about, I thought this kid was one of the popular kids, right? I wouldn't have imagined kind of the struggles that this person takes home. They always seem happy. They're always seem to be involved. They always seem right with the group. So I guess, you know, when I look at this kind of sense of belonging, it it's hard because what seemingly the perspective is that they're doing really well. They're doing well in school, in the classroom. There's really no issues. They're doing great at recess. They're not alone. They're interacting. They're part of a of something but at the same time they're still coming home and they don't feel a sense of connection and that's just one example of a decent amount of people who've come up to me in multiple different scenarios really odd um just talking about kind of their child's experiences that again in most of these cases i would have never expected this parent to come to me and talk to their child having known them these are in the elementary school um, and I think it, I, I think, you know, it, it, it happens at the high school level as, as well. Um, and I think it's across various avenues, be it the corners of the school or the halls of the school or, um, at sports games or their level. 
in the sports games or whatever. I'm not a sports person, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's say sports games. Um, so I just I just find it interesting to think about when we've we've talked about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we've talked so much about color. And then I don't think it's a huge surprise that when I talk about inclusion or belonging, I think about um, well, what does it mean to be neurotypical versus neurodiverse? And when do we talk about that in a conversation? And then this one example of a parent who doesn't fit in either of those categories, whose child has seemingly no struggles, but yet here we are with struggles. So when you came to me and shared this an experience, which I don't think was this one, was a different one, but you nevertheless, it was a different example. Um, it, it struck a chord because in all of 2021, post 2020, I was talking with people who had said things to me about their experience and I recorded their voices and I, uh, and then I recorded over in their words, their stories in order to keep it anonymous. And this is something that I shared with a couple of you, but I don't think all of you, and I'm ready to share with all of you, because I think it's important for us to know whether you're the valedictorian of the school or the schooler who is now in middle school. Um, these things, they would, um, a lot of the stories thinking about at the time, it was new to me. I really just wanted to know, but what I'm talking to understand is that it isn't really about race, it is more um, and there's um, communities of, who feel a little bit more empowered and empowered in power than than others. I want to remind us that like we have an amazing school. We work really hard. We excel on so many levels. But unless we really spot and are able to define opportunities for improvement, we don't improve. This is the reason why we're as good as we are, I think, is that we find opportunities for improvement and then we work to improve it. So this conversation isn't about, oh, look how awful we are. It's more about, are we thinking about the culture that we create? Because belonging is a feeling. You can't make someone feel a sense of belonging, but what is the culture that we're creating and where are we thinking about creating it? Are we thinking about that recess field? Are we thinking about the hallways? Are we thinking, you know, what, what are the ways? In which we're... Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, it's always, it's really difficult uh, for a lot of kids. I, I didn't grow up here. I spent a lot of my childhood in the hospital. I was the kid that was bullied, I, you know. Um, Sorry. It is what it is. It made, me, it, made it, it made me strong. But that is, you know, it just is what it is. I, I, my parents were, and my family were, were completely, you know, they were supportive and basically taught me to be able to walk away and say, you know what? You're just saying, so, you know, you're just a, you're jerk. And, you know, like, uh, it, 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 I think we also need to, f as much as we want to make them feel belong, but we need to also learn to teach these kids that it's, you're going to have to deal with people like this your whole life. This is how you treat, you know, this is, this is how you empower yourself. This is how you find a sense of belonging by creating your own sense of belonging because, you know, obviously that, you know, nobody else can do it for you. Right. Not only try to create conditions, create a culture where people feel a sense of belonging, but you also teach them to be really resilient in their outlook. Yeah. So that's part and, of it. You know, and that, yeah, right now may not be great, but it's, you know, just push through it. You've got, you know, like, there's so much better waiting for you. Um, and I will say that I know there was a time when, you know, one of our students, we had a student who came here from somewhere else. The biggest, the, I think the biggest factor had to do with the fact that they were urban, not necessarily, you know, the color of their skin. And, you know, some people 
would say that, you know, he, he had great experiences. He had horror and others would say horrible experiences. But the only thing I take away from it is where would they have been if they had not been here? Where would they have ended up? Was it, was this, you know, was this a perfect, perfect environment? No. Did, were there some really stupid things that were said? And, and, you know, everyone on a learning curve? Yeah. But that child is successful. That child is, I'm very, very proud of. I absolutely, truly believe that was, a, you know, are we perfect? No, not even close. But. Did that child still but get a better education and end up with a better life than had they stayed where they were, where their best friend was killed in a drive-by gang war? Thank goodness for a step up above that. Well, but I, I <laughs> also, I'm saying, but I, I think that but, but you I, know, grit I, and resilience, nurturing grit and resilience is important. And I also want to know what is our responsibility for working with the other students well, that might be making them feel a sense of not belonging. But what I also kind of want to dive into that because I think it's it's okay to to, to build grit and resilience. Um, and it's okay to imagine that maybe they wouldn't have had that same experience at a different school, but that's not for us to say. I, I think the other thing we also have to do as a community is hold people accountable, uh, oh, yeah. both when they do right, but also when they do when they do wrong. And you talked a little bit earlier about mistakes and, you know, how people are afraid to make mistakes. I think that's part of it. But I also think the reality is we live in a world today where when people make mistakes, instead of saying, okay, you made a mistake, what are you learning from? How are you going to change? What are the things you can learn from that? We allow them to make those mistakes over and over again. Uh, oh, I agree with and, that. And I think a lot of that does come down to power and class and race and how we treat uh, people who make mistakes that are this group versus this group. And I think um, it's just really important to step back and say, you know, yes, you may have gone through this really tough experience, but you learned grit. But we we don't know how that affected that that student or that person. Right. We can we can assume we can make judgments or whatever, but we don't know in that moment what they experienced, what they were going through. And so, while it's well, oh, no, 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 I meant as in as in we need to also help them to you know yes. how to how to face that. Cr so that right. you know, you know what I'm saying. So empowering Absolutely. them. To say, you know, you may not, because nine times out of ten, you cannot change a bully if they don't want to change. So you need to. Uh, I, I, well, I would say like, the, and I think that's where I was going is like, I think the empower. Uh, South Hadley coming out of uh, Phoebe Prince um, will probably say after millions of dollars and effort and national uh, recognition on the issue that there are things that you can do. Yeah. And I, I think that it's important for us to not say that like, oh, boys will be boys, you know. Good old boys will be good old boys. We I wasn't talking about that. I'm, I'm talking about girls. <laughs> no, I'm I I talking about, about the mean girls. girls. Yeah. But, but I mean, taking it to the bully, I mean, that's that's obviously extreme. Yeah. That's the extreme. Yeah. I really like, like this word belonging. I hadn't really thought yeah. about that. And I was just thinking, wouldn't it be great if everybody who graduated felt like I really belonged there? And especially here where there's not only that nice, I would be proud to feel like we created that culture. Right. And I guess especially because we do have such a small community. And so you could almost have that individual interaction with each student throughout their yeah. time here to get a better sense of what would make them feel a sense of belonging within their community. Um, because the reality is it could be a kid that was next door who seems like they fit in, who doesn't feel like they belong. Right. right, who looks like everyone else in the graduating class or almost everyone else in the graduating class. I, hadn't feel, I felt like that. I, I hadn't realized that as a metric. It's all, but you could test it. You yeah, sure can. Yeah. Right. Who, how many people belong? Yeah. You feel like you do. So if you do, if you do the Gallup polls about satisfaction at work, mm -hmm. they always have a question, and everybody makes fun of it. It's, do you have a best friend at work? And they find that is one of the biggest indicators of whether you're going to stay at your job. Huh. And so you know, do you feel like you belong? Do you have a best friend at school? Right. right. Those are two indicators that. Right. Um, but getting to your point, Tara, and I really appreciate you reading that. That yeah. that is not unfortunately new to me either, right? Yeah. I've heard that consistently over the yeah. years. My, as somebody who moved here 14 or so years ago, my feeling is my own, my you know, experience is my own, but the, um, I've never seen that sort of, from just that sort of, I don't belong because there's whatever, there's history here or whatever. I've never seen that as stemming from malfeasance or not malfeasance or malevolence, I should say. 
but uh, it's more just sort of that's the way it is. That's how you know. It's not intentional, from what I've seen. It's a default position. So that when you think about how do you create belong belonging, right. how do you sort of build that big scope to get people like to, to say, oh, I need to expand my sphere a little bit, and others to become part of that sphere. Well, intentional. And I think that's like where I... know some of the things we are doing. Would yes, of course. Um, so one thing, just uh, some of this work connects with some of the work that Michelle and Spencer are doing. Involved, or I just want I want the community to know that there are designs in place and structures in place, and that doesn't mean that these can't be expanded upon or improved. But I think it's helpful to our community. It's been for a while to the parents who have recently chosen chosen Hadley Public Schools, which we really appreciate some of the things that we have in place. Responsive classroom is a research based way to provide teachers with explicit tools and curriculum materials to facilitate things like morning meeting. Mm -hmm. Some of that is about teaching students how to communicate with one another and to be in community with one another and talk with one another. It's just one example. Some of the other work that we've done with social and emotional learning, the coaching that Michelle has provided and having a social and emotional learning curriculum. So providing students with concrete tools as well as to practice building, sustaining positive social relationships outside of perhaps the most familiar social circles. And also giving students content knowledge about what are the, what are the skills that I need as a person to have positive relationships with others. So how can I practice and develop empathy? How can I practice self-awareness, self-regulation? How can I advocate for myself when I am feeling like maybe I wish something else me to participate? Mm -hmm. For the older students, last year we started working with Suffolk University on restorative justice. We had our first cohort of educators that participated in that training. I also participated in it, so we're cohort one. We're now in the second, I guess, like tier two of training, and all of the remaining staff at, at Hopkins Academy participated in tier one today, and we'll also do that tomorrow. That's why we created, we had three PD days at the start of the year. Um, and we did invite, and the faculty really appreciated her work with them. Dr. Khalees Warnham kind of connects with uh, standard four also. So she came in March of last year and worked with our entire faculty on what it means to be a culturally proficient educator, what it means to engage all students, to create a classroom environment in which all students feel connected. And she will be working, she'll be here on Wednesday and focusing very much on the elementary. So it was all faculty last year in March. And then for elementary teachers, sometimes these things are, if you want to sit down and have a conversation about, um, connection and the things that interfere with that. Elementary teachers are looking for tools that are developmentally appropriate for young children to have those conversations. And then she'll work with our entire faculty on September 29th and she'll be back in March. I'm not saying any of those things to say, hey, we're all set here. I'm not saying that at all. I, this feedback is so important. I just thought it was important for the community to hear and to understand that this has been a long-term comprehensive investment. The school committee created the position of an SEL coach, teachers get coaching, and, and we want practical tools. So like in restorative justice, every single faculty member is practicing being in circle, facilitating circles. Mm -hmm. Last year, teachers who were trained started that. Part of that is it creates spaces where students who would not normally mix for whatever reason, now are solving problems collaboratively in the classroom. So I just wanted to share some of those examples. Thank you, Sunny. And I yeah. think it's really important um, that you share that and that we all know the why. Because mm -hmm. we are doing these things like the survey and the equity mm -hmm. dashboard, and we get questions from people throughout the year. And we like we wonder in the back of our mind, like, why are we doing that? Or why is it that way? But like, this is the larger goal here. And I love what you just said, Paul, about like, wouldn't it be great if every student who graduated? Yeah. And I think like, okay, that means we really need to keep track of like how they felt in 11th grade mm -hmm. and also 10th and 9th mm -hmm. and all the grades that lead up to it. Um, and that is, you know, I'm really glad that we're not starting from zero, that we're like, we've got, we're, we're far from starting from zero. We, we're really on top of the many things that we should be doing. And I also want to ask, 
you know, how does like the whole school experience mm -hmm. also includes that recess field. It also includes the behind the stairwell. And of course, educators don't have eyes everywhere, but that's not the point. The point is about creating a culture and um, it's about working with the students who need to like gain more grit and resilience, mm -hmm. but also those other students who may be unintentionally or unaware of the impact of their words and their actions. And I just would add that building that culture, not just within the school, but within the community, nice. with, with, the, with the parents, with the families, um, because I think that's, you know, we talk a lot about asking, we ask an awful lot of the kids, but also making sure that families understand that what we're trying to build here is this inclusive space where kids feel belong, right. a sense of belonging. Right. What would it look like for the World's Fair, but in an environment that pulls in a lot of people of color, and the Memorial Day Parade were to make like a Memorial Day Parade might be the place where you might feel least a sense of belonging if you were part of those mm -hmm. other groups. Like if you just scan the environment, for instance, um, I think there's a lot that we could do. There's amazing traditions and a town that is that cares a lot about its um, it, it's what it does and puts out in the world. And I think that. This is sort of like the next area for improvement, in my view. I agree. And I think it's it's important because, right, the town does care very much, especially about the schools in general, right? So we want the students that, you know, administration works so hard on bringing students into the school and then remaining in the school. We want to make sure they feel comfortable in the school. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a question. One, I think your role is just really key. And I think it's pretty evident now that it's pretty key. <laughs> Um, but so, you know, in the beginning of the conversation, we started talking about like, what are these areas, right? So you said you feel a sense of, you know, classroom connections in, in the classroom or at recess or in the halls or under the stairs. And so, I, and maybe this is unattainable, but thinking outside the box. So how, one, how are we measuring? So you can teach somebody something. And so there's a difference between teaching them having them take a test and give the right answer and then putting that in to the real world, right? And utilizing that skill. And I think that's a really hard thing for, for kids and adults to do. You can learn something and you can take a test, but now you have to put it into the, to the real world, into recess, into the hallway, into it. And it is a, a culture. So how do we even begin to kind of track that students are even learning these concepts when they're taught in the classroom. Oh, that's a good How question. are we tracking them? Yeah. So I'm going to also ask Michelle to jump in, but I would say some of the ways to can track that are all the positive behavioral interventions and supports is designed around looking at, first of all, tracking what students are doing and expecting mm -hmm. their desired behavior. So that is about including others and being kind. That's the K and Hawks at both schools. So we, we reward and reinforce the focus in both restorative justice and in positive behavioral uh, interventions and supports is on, um, is that rather than um, spending all of our energy always pointing out what you shouldn't be doing, right? Reinforcing the behavioral, the behavior that we expect. Right. But then the inverse in terms of, well, are they practicing the desired behaviors? One, we can track how frequently students are receiving wings, what teachers are reporting, what students are saying. And then we can also see, do we see a decrease in, in the behaviors we don't desire, right? So we track that in school brains and we can track the kinds of behaviors we're seeing, time of day, where these things are occurring. We look at all of those data and Michelle works with teams and we have new this year each school has a counselor who'll be the pbis team facilitator michelle used to do all that but instead she'll be supporting those team facilitators and they look at that at those data at least quarterly sometimes more often and then they say how do we strengthen the systems that will reinforce desired behavior so that's one way that we quantitatively track are we seeing an improvement right in reporting of undesired behaviors, either seeing somebody who's engaging in a behavior that we don't want to see or a student saying, I just had this experience. And we have our survey now. 
And we can use the um, social emotional behavior screener as a tool um, to show some improvement as well. Because uh, you can look that at that um, similar to PDIS structures from a system structure or an individual student structure. So when you pull up a whole class or a grade level at once, you can look. Uh, vertical analysis will give you like the skills by columns. Where are are there particular skill deficits yeah. in groups of students or whatnot? I do want to add one other thing. It's not it's not a deflection. Um, but it is something I think is really important to keep in mind. I don't think this issue of some feeling a lack of a sense of belonging is unique to Hadley either. I think it's no, a sign no, no, of our no. times. I have to no, remind no. myself of that too, because yeah. it's sometimes hard to hear those right. things right, as right. It, because this place is near and dear to me and my, my children are here and they've had, you know, unique experiences too. Yes. So I think, um, but I want like the public to hear that yes, as absolutely. well, yeah. that, um, I think most of these people read um, Stolen Focus, was it last summer or two summers ago? Now, I, did, I don't know if you read another one of his books, Lost Connections, but it's 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 connected to my work. So I try to keep up with some of these things. And even the book, one of the books I read this summer, Generations, um, gets at this too. But the as more advanced we get technologically, we're losing these connections with people. Mm -hmm. So um this like false sense of connection so uh, I, again that's not a deflection but I, I do think the schools our school in particular is doing a lot of things to build that up but i think you know i'm one of them parents my age maybe we didn't even realize that we didn't feel that sense of belonging that that we're now trying to instill in our mm -hmm. children um so I, th I think it is challenging but i do i do think we're, we're, right. we're moving in the right direction, certainly. And I think we're doing a lot of really good things. And the other piece is it's one of those things that um, reminds me of like the nature versus nurture argument that you have to look at like the system, but then you also have to look at the individual. Um, I can tell you, I have two children. Um, one is, and I'm, I'm going to try not to <laughs> to tenders to, to protect their privacy. One is particularly good, I would argue, incredibly um, socially intelligent, emotionally intelligent, just really good at reading people. Um, the other one struggles to express feelings beyond the basics of like happy and angry. Um, so I learned because of that drastic difference too in my children. I'd be curious to know the ages of some of the people you're hearing from too, because I think that's a piece of what's considered. Going back to your question, the Gallup poll, and then do you have a friend? Um, mine who struggles with recognizing emotions at time given the day may not accurately answer that. I think it's something that some ch children also need to be explicitly taught um but again I, I think we're doing a lot of things to give them it's a really hard thing to measure but i think we have a little bit in the data um that annie just spoke about too but when we are immersing all our children in like the circle practices of responsive classroom and the circles at uh the restorative justice circles that will be happening as part of the advisory curriculum almost every week at hopkins this year um i think we're seeing firsthand those five social emotional competencies that we're trying to capture in all of our students. And I think this amplifies though the need, Michelle, and by I am I'm total team Michelle. Mm -hmm. Um I think this amplifies the need of why we need you, but also like just like thinking about um expanding our high school into different avenues beyond just basic curriculum, these things take time. Mm -hmm. So ensuring that we're measuring and changing with the time in order to ensure that mm -hmm. we're making a positive impact to the kids. The other thing that I just wanted to say to you was I found it interesting when, you know, you were talking about the pandemic, because I literally just yesterday I was talking to a high school mom, again, one of these weird things, and um, we'd never met each other before, and we started talking about, you know, just interactions and kids and going out, and she was this 10th grader, and she said, it's so funny, because when I was a kid, you know, we went out, we did things, and she goes, I don't know if it's COVID or something else, but like kids these days are actually less comfortable going out and are more comfortable socializing with each other from home on their phones, on their computers. And it was just such a foreign concept for her and for me to kind of talk about. It's like, 
how do we like help these kids navigate in this world when they're just growing up in this completely different world? But then also what did COVID do to that? Right. You know, which I think is interesting to think about this recent grant that you just got and how this is impacting children and, and what we can do. I just think it's interesting that she says kids, they'd rather stay home mm -hmm. and interact on a device rather than seeing each other in person it's harder for them they, to they meet don't have to person. put themselves in that yeah. traditional environment that we've known for generations has not fostered a sense of belonging they could go custom create their own environment mm -hmm. using the phone or the computer i think there's just a lot more we know now about belonging in english yeah. and the the research is clear we know that it happens through setting culture in all the different spaces that we're in and I'm excited to see what we can do this next year with the tools that we've already put in place and no doubt the tools that you will continue to build upon. And that's another place where we can use feedback from the alum from alumni and say, you know, wow, where how idea. you know if Absolutely. you were back in middle school, what would you want yep. us to help you with? Right. What do you, you know, what makes it because each of you know the, the stages right you're gonna have a kid that at one point feels completely like they belong but then they go through the whole the hormone mm -hmm. changes they go through other life changes and then they don't feel like they belong and how do we get them back to feeling that way and because it is well, it's, a, it's, they, it, it, it's a constant changing hormone but it could yeah. also be well, like you can feel a lot like, yeah. like, like that age but not a sense of belonging in this other so again mm -hmm. both things can be true in the same school system in yep. two different environments mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. it would be great in that survey i love what you just suggested to ask um, think back to three times where you felt a strong sense of belonging Think back to three times where you did not feel a strong sense of belonging. Let's see what we learn. Yeah. And I like the end vision really of what Paul had stated. Yes. On you're graduating. Do you feel like you belonged there? Yeah. I really kind of like that as like the vision, right? right? Like, of course, you know, just like anything else, you're never going to get 100%. But I mean, wouldn't that be great if the goal is that, you know, you're able to foster a sense of belonging of a, a student feels as though they really had a place that they were and now they go out on top of this world um maybe they feel stronger because of that but they, they no, undoubtedly research shows that if they know that there are people behind them who care about them right. where they've where they've come from uh that they feel a sense of happiness factor in their mm -hmm. careers and their lives mm -hmm. right um that is unmatched mm -hmm. to uh, to other things so no doubt Okay. Third powerful. Well, I'm sorry. This is this said. Uh, said Hopkins is a place where you know it's a school where everybody belongs. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. Love that. Mm -hmm. That I love that. Can we, can, we I, I, can we take it a step further though? Can you say not Hopkins but Hadley? That's what I said. Yes. 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 yes, 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 yes. Okay, um, just just to make yeah. Yeah. happy. I know. <laughs> I just want to tell you because it will make. I think it'll make you folks happy. I'm sure, it wouldn't doubt me, but Michelle could attest to this. Every year at opening day, what do I say? Everybody matters. Everybody belongs. Yeah. It's the leading value in our district. We say we have four overarching values. We just reviewed them today with the faculty and staff. Number one is inclusivity and belonging. Number two is an appreciation for diversity. Number three is growth mindset and deep learning. Yeah. And our fourth one is empathy and kindness and civility. Every year, we start the year and we remind each other, everybody matters, everybody belongs. And it's said repeatedly, it's a mantra among the faculty. So hopefully by way of today's investment of time, <laughs> we are now fully in understanding That's and great. in alignment and in support. And we're looking, you know, looking forward to more on that front. I want to do a time check at 737. We have not gotten to one of the standards and that is um, professional culture, but we've been talking about professional culture all Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah i think yeah. i gave you guys all the examples you of the really PD did line you really did yeah. yeah so i'll just take one moment to ask is there anything else that you would like to share about this standard professional culture for my colleagues that you think are important for us to state um, as we look out at this next year i i would just reiterate and i don't know if it goes in this but i'm, I'm gonna just i'm gonna tuck it in this one that as we continue to talk about belonging and culture um that, that uh, we talk about it with faculty, with staff, with students, but also with the greater community. Because I do, I do think that 
it's important to bring families into this conversation so that they understand kind of the, what we're trying to accomplish Very. rather than just, you know, obviously we you know, we know thousands of people watch this, these meetings on <laughs> every time. You, thousands. <laughs> tens of thousands. I'll say that out loud. But I think it's, shout it, out. yeah. <laughs> shout out to, to mom. <laughs> but I think it is important because really I think important. it's it, we put a we put a heavy load on the students, we put a he heavy load yeah. on faculty yeah. and staff, but also um, we're hearing it from parents, and yeah, I think absolutely. making sure that other parents understand kind of what's happening absolutely. in this community. Absolutely. I would like yeah. a second that, yeah. and I would like to say too, I appreciate how much I appreciate the the faculty, the administration, the, the fellow school committee folks, just seeing what's happening in some of our neighboring towns. Makes me really appreciate what we have. Um, I know I can take it for granted, and so. Thoughts and prayers to Amherst. Yes. Okay. Um, well, thank you all. Thank you. It's good. Thanks for thanks for facilitating. This is great. food. Yeah. Everything's better with food. Yes. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Try to yeah, yeah. Get into that. Food. Oh my God. <laughs> Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye.